Daddy, help me. See? Where are you? And welcome to episode 29 of Voices in the Static. My name is Whitney, and I am the owner of the Silent Hill fan site, SilentHillHistoricalSociety.com. Today, I'm joined by several of my friends for an in-depth discussion on my favorite of the series, the original Silent Hill. Okay, why don't you all introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Destiny Maddox. I am the managing editor at Rely on Horror, and I worked with Whitney on her previous, well, I guess it would have been not so previous to you, Project um, Silent Hill Experience. Uh, I'm CJ, and I am the editor-in-chief of Rely on Horror, and uh, Whitney and I have been doing uh, Silent Hill stuff and horror game stuff for many years. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how long, because I forget. Very long time. At least 10. At least 10, yeah. Yeah. Forever. Uh, I guess I'm Rourke Keegan. I also write for Rely on Horror. Um, If you visit that site, I'll be the guy that Everyone yells at for being either too positive or too negative about Resident Evil. <laughs> I bet you've never even played the game, Mark. I know. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm AJ. I am uh, known as the Gaming Muse over on YouTube, and I've been making Silent Hill videos and analysis for about eight years now, and just recently wrote a book about it. She's a nerd. I am. <laughs> Where well, there's we none of those on this podcast, so... Uh, yeah. You can purchase the book at thegamingmuse.com, or net. Cool beans. Don't worry, I'll also put uh, links in the news post as well. And I am William Longwood. I'm a contributor to RelyOnHorror.com. I recently did a audio interview and written interview with Michael Quinn, the uh, voice actor who played Harry Mason in the first game. And I also did a retrospective on the, the 20th anniversary of Silent Hill. I still can't believe you found him. That was so awesome. You finally cleared up the mystery of it not being Michael Go. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a couple Michael Goes, right? And uh, Yeah, there's the one from Batman and the one that plays Lord Sadler in Resident Evil 4. Yeah, well, I can get into that later if we want. But yeah, that was a that that interview took a couple years, actually, to finally nail down. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was pretty cool that we actually got to do that. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk about it in, in a little bit. So, but before we jump into discussing the game, I first want to apologize. It's been quite a while since I last recorded an episode. In fact, I believe my last episode was about the cancellation of Silent Hills back well, in. We know whose fault it was. 2015. So this is probably needless to say, but. Silent Hill's cancellation really bummed me out, and honestly, after it happened, I wasn't in the mood to discuss the series, since it was clear Konami would rather make pachinko machines instead of another proper game. But my love for the series was rekindled recently after listening to some other delightful podcasts discussing the games as relative newcomers. Shout out to Brock and Rachel of Less Than Silent Hills, and Justin and Larry from the Here's Johnny podcast and replaying several of the games myself for charity on my own and with the Rely on Horror team. I got the itch to discuss them once again, hence the resurrection of my podcast. So I thought it might be fun to dedicate an episode to each game in the series and discuss our own experiences, theories, and like how well it has or hasn't held up over the years. There will be tons of spoilers throughout, but for this episode, I kind of want to keep it limited to the first game. I'm assuming most of those listening right now have probably played or watched a playthrough of the first game, but just in case, here's a little summary. Silent Hill is the first installment in Konami's amazing and now likely dead survival horror series. It originally released on the PlayStation in February 1999 in North America. Yes, February, not January. March 1999 in Japan and August 1999 in Europe and is considered to be one of the best games for the system's run. Players take control of Harry Mason, a widower and writer who takes his seven-year-old adopted daughter Cheryl to the lake resort town of Silent Hill in hopes of a relaxing vacation. They had a late start due to some car trouble and didn't reach the town limits until well after nightfall. Just as the two were entering the Silent Hill, a female figure walks out into the road and in an attempt to avoid collision, Harry is forced to go off-road. Upon waking from the crash, Harry's alarm not only defined that Cheryl has run off, but the town is completely deserted, 
foggy, and with snow falling out of season. Where did everyone go? Why are the streets crawling with monsters? And most importantly, where did Cheryl go? It's an interesting premise. I know when I read a small preview in one of my brother's gaming magazines, I think it was like a EGM maybe in 98, I was intrigued and I made sure to play it as soon as it was out in the US. What about you guys? What made you pick up the title and give it a go? I started playing it actually the hurricane after Hurricane Katrina. There were several kind of in a row. And I had played Silent Hill 3 in the aftermath of Katrina. And when the next one came around, my friend that still had power had like all our high school crowd just living in his living room because he still had power in three televisions and three game systems. So they were like, hey, if you liked Silent Hill 3, the rest of us will watch and you can play the game. So I popped in Silent Hill and played and it took like four days to finish it. And every night, sneaking back under the cover of dark through you know it was all closed off because there was curfew you weren't supposed to be out at night especially in areas with no power yes dangerous. you couldn't get caught yeah well i mean real dangerous because you did not want to get picked up by the police or the national guard under <laughs> martial law so i would sneak back and every now and then when you saw like a national guard humvee coming you'd have to dive into the bushes and wait until they passed and you'd be sitting there in the bushes thinking to yourself, why did I pick that game, though? <laughs> uh, well, I <clears throat> I played the series in a really weird order. Um, my very first uh, exposure to it was in an issue of Electronic Gaming Monthly. And it was a two-page spread on Silent Hill 3. I guess it had just been announced or something because there wasn't a whole lot of information, but there was a lot of screenshots and them speculating about what the screenshots were. And I only like, I don't even know where the imagery is actually in the game because the camera angles were weird, but I found the images themselves like so disturbing at like 11 or 12, whenever that game came out. You can't tell it, what area it's from. No. I, well, like some of the, the one is the, the, weird zebra dog things. It's the first time that you see one. Mm -hmm. um, it's a screenshot of that. Um, so the, that mall. Encounter. the mall. Yeah, the, yeah, so the mall. Play. There's another one that's hurt. That's Heather just looking at what looks like bloody cage work. And it looks like there's like skinned people on the other side of it or something. Okay. Uh, that's in the hospital. Yeah. I'm about to say it's okay. probably Brookhaven. Um, the Silent Hill 3 is probably the one I'm least familiar with. But anyway, I found, I found that imagery really creepy and unsettling compared to the other horror stuff I was in. So I kind of wrote it off as like, that's too scary for me for a really long time. And much, much later, a girl I was dating wanted me to play Silent Hill 2. And I played through like the first half of it. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. But I didn't own a PlayStation. So that was it for years and years and years. Um, and then I played Homecoming was the first one I ever actually beat. Um, and then it just went through that, f through the whole series from there in weird order. Silent Hill 1 was the last one I played um, until Downpour came out. And I really enjoyed it. I really love that era of PlayStation games. I, I Something about the way that engine looks, because I think it's the same engine as Metal Gear Solid 1, where everything looks like it's made out of little X's. I, I don't know how to describe it. Um I really liked its visuals. I really, I loved the music. Uh, oh, that's another thing. I heard the music before anything else as well. A friend burned me the CD. Hmm. Uh, so what, I so of Silent Hill one or just the Silent general? One. Okay. Um, he, he burned me the, a CD of the of the Silent Hill one soundtrack, um, and so I was super familiar with the music, but not the context. So playing the game and hearing the context for the first time was really interesting, especially because that CD that they released isn't really the music that's actually in the game. It's like a new, like, I don't know. I don't know if remastered is the right way to put it, but it's clearly like a new recording or something. And all the tracks drift into one another. And there's also obviously missing tracks as well. But, uh, Are you yeah. Talking about the finally, Japanese soundtrack? I don't know what region it's from, but it, it's, a, it's, the Silent Hill 1 soundtrack, each track is designed to not stop. It just sounds like it bleeds into the next track. Um, it's missing 
all of the music that's associated with Kaufman, uh, like that, that theme he has. And it ends on, I want to say it ends on Silent Hill Other Side instead of Esperando, or however it's pronounced. It's, I'm also trying, I'm also trying to remember of this music, this CD, because I have long since replaced it with the complete soundtrack from the internet. Okay, well, the original Japanese release, it did have Other Side. It was like a hidden track, so it would be dead air. And then all of a sudden, it go, like after a yeah, minute or two. Yeah, 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 I do remember that. Um, so, yeah. do you remember what year? So we got like 2003. Uh, the year I would have played it, because the, the the year I would have played it would be, I want to say 2012. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, it was, I was super late. I played it right before Downpour came out. I was uh, probably about that late too. I think I played. I, I got into the series through the movie, and. Um, played three first and the others kind of all together, the PS2 generation and Homecoming. And I think I played Silent Hill 1 after that. So probably sometime around the time of Homecoming. Did anybody play Silent Hill first? Me? Me, apparently. Just I technically, me. <laughs> I technically did, but I never accomplished anything with it. Yeah, I, pl- I played it right when it came out and it was the only Silent Hill game. And I feel really old because I was in high school. <laughs> yeah, uh, my, my story is not too uh, dissimilar than from Rourke's. Um, uh, had uh, had some familiarity with the series um, because my dad had bought the original game for PlayStation along with some other games when we first got a PlayStation a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess I, he probably got it around the time Silent Hill released. I can't really remember. So at least... 20 years ago and um i remember playing it and it was too scary for me as far as i'd get was the, the school and <laughs> yeah, the little kids not... the little kids never scared me it was it's always not like that far. i no. know it was, it was i was like an eight or nine mm. i didn't know what i was doing and like the, the, the little kids didn't scare me uh, but the dogs and the pterodactyls which are stupid they, they were like oh no freaked me out a bit um mm. then i didn't return to the series until um two uh, no, I, I remember a commercial for two, but I didn't have a PlayStation 2 at the time. I had an N64, and I was like, oh, I guess I'm not going to play that. I um, completely forgot about it. And then when Silent Hill Origins was in development, uh, one of the soundtrack songs leaked. Um, I think it was Blowback. I think. Um, and I remember listening to it and going, wow, that's really beautiful. I like that music. And then I started looking into the series more, reading about everything I could. Um, then the movie came out, and I was really interested in just getting back into the series. So I'm pretty sure I started with with two proper, went through two all the way. Um, and I think I did one. Yeah, then I did one because I knew three was a sequel, direct sequel. Then I got three, and then I got four. And I would say that was around... 2008? Maybe around there, yeah. 2007? Well, you said you yep. Origins soundtrack leak that that was two thousand six probably because it came out yeah, in two thousand seven. So within the last, within like the two or three years after that, mm-hmm. I just started following up with the series, catching up, and doing all this stuff. Um, and yeah, this the first game was very interesting to me. Um, finally beat it some years ago. Um, yeah, and that's when I fell in love with it. I just I think I did mostly back to back. I remember actually I bought copies of the ones I didn't have, so I bought two. I bought three. I bought four, like new copies that I could get on eBay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yep, and that was pretty much it. Yeah. No, and real quick, have so did you also see the movie first? Because also I did as well. I don't so remember if I played. Us. I don't remember if I played two first or saw the movie first. I think I played. I I might have been the movie then too. I don't remember. I played most of the games before I saw the movie, but I definitely saw the movie before I played the first game. Because I remember back on Whispers in the Dark, mm-hmm. we had a conversation where I 
offhandedly went, well, the, the movie's basically just the first game. And Whitney went, no, it's fucking not. <laughs> um, that, was, uh, that was definitely and, me. <laughs> and, and, and I will admit, though, a, lot, a large part of that was because my first time playing it, I missed all of the Kaufman stuff. I just walked right the fuck past it. Uh, William, what about you? Oh, I didn't play it right when it came out. Um, I was in high school in 99. Oh, thank God I'm not the only one. (laughs) You got another oldie here. It's okay. Okay. I'm like, all these children. Oh, my God. (laughs) Yeah. We love Fortnite. (laughs) I probably didn't play it until uh, probably around 2000 when I was in college. I I guess I was a freshman in college. Um, Buddy of mine, um, for the longest time, I thought it was an RPG for whatever reason. Like, I'd see it in Blockbuster, and I kind of look at it, but I wasn't sure... Parasite Eve had come out, I think, before then, and I I didn't quite know what to make of it. Um, so one day I finally went to the game website, I read the plot synopsis, and I was sold. So I took it, me and my friend played it, and pretty much it, it was my first horror game. Um, oh, even, even before Resident, e- Resident Evil, you didn't play that one? Played RE2 um, with uh, someone I was dating. Um, she had just showed me it just to, you know, sh- show what it was like. And I immediately started firing round after round. I was, she's like, no, 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 you got to save your ammo in this one. I was like, what? Um, so I think I technically played that one before Silent Hill, but Silent Hill one was really the first horror video game that, tr- you know, truly showed me what, what a game could do like that. Um, kept me up all night. I had all the lights on. It was one of those things. Um, and I think my friend wasn't as scared, but I would always jump and scare him more when we were playing. <laughs> so he'd, he'd be scared at the game, and then he'd get mad at me for reacting, or overreacting to it. But yeah, at the time, I had never really had a movie, book, or game affect me like that. Oh, so that stuck and, with you. Yeah, it remains my favorite horror game of all time. Um, after that, series, um, pretty much, you know, day of release. Um, um or OPM, it's probably EGM, because I don't think OPM was super big in the early 2000s, but I remember they had a little blurb, and I think it was just like a shot of Harry in his Jeep, not the bad ending, plus one, which is the one I first got, which is my favorite ending, but it was, I think it was just him in his Jeep, and it was the first blurb I had heard about Konami going forward with Silent Hill 2, and I was like, oh my god, because I was like, a little game that I liked that might never ever get a sequel. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, 2001, Silent Hill 2, and I pretty much got all the games after that. I think the only game I was having doubts about was Origins when I was first seeing that. Climax? or, or it's, Yeah, it's Climax. Uh, Climax LA was the one that first had it, and then it... Okay, uh... yeah, I was, seeing, I was seeing, like, development footage, and I was like, ooh, I don't know about that one. And um, I didn't ever buy the Vita one, Book of Memories. I played it, and I beat it. But that's the only one I think, besides like the Japanese um, play novels and stuff like that, and the phone games. I think that's the only one I actually that I don't own. Did you play the arcade? Did not. Okay. I've seen the arcade in person, or I've seen it online, but I haven't actually played it myself. Well, <clears throat> you you mentioned that you weren't sure it was going to get a sequel, but Silent Hill did eventually make over two million uh, sales worldwide. And over the years, it's been credited as one of the scariest games ever made for the console. With that kind of sales and praise, it's really hard to believe that both Konami Corporate and Silent Hill's staff didn't have high hopes for the game while it was in development. When I discussed the game's development in my in-depth Let's Play, I think what most surprised me was how toxic the work environment was for Team Silent. But you know, given what we know now about Konami, now thanks to the fallout from Kojima's firing, I guess I shouldn't have been that surprised that it was pretty shit even back in 1999. William and AJ, you both made incredible 20th anniversary retrospectives about the making of the game. Would either of you like to talk a little bit more about the hurdles the team had to go through to get Silent Hill made? I can talk a little. Um... The team was uh, very young. The the people that were on this team, most of them, this was their first big project. It was the director's first time as director. And uh, they, they had to jump through a lot of extra hoops to prove they could do what they said they could. Specifically, the story I know is um, Sato Takoyoshi, who did all the CG for the game uh, by himself, uh, basically was, uh, when he came into the team, into Konami, uh, they put him behind a computer and, and had him being trained, and he was doing work for higher-ups and not getting the credit. 
because Japanese culture, business culture, he was the junior member. These older folks who he was doing the work for were getting the credit for this. And he said, I want the credit for my own work. I want to work on a big project like Metal Gear or Silent Hill. Mm -hmm. And they said, fine, you can do it, but you're going to do all of it and you're not going to get any support. So he agreed. And for about two years, this man basically slept under his desk, worked 15 hour days. Uh, and animated the all the CG movies, all the cutscenes of the first Silent Hill game entirely by himself. Yes, he did, which is really mm -hmm. amazing. Uh, did he yeah. also not know what white people looked like? Uh, well, he said um, that he 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 said that there wasn't a lot of real life inspiration around mm -hmm. where he was living, so he had to look towards you know movies and television and whatnot to get the faces correct. I do want to give him props for doing all that and being probably miserable by the end, by the end but still doing the blooper reel. Yes. <laughs> Bless you. Know, I was just going to say, we were talking about the blooper reel. That shot of Lisa laughing looks so incredibly good for a PS1 mm -hmm. pre-rendered thing. I mean, that that's an incredible looking piece of animation. And, and, and Sato-san, it's because he insisted on doing all the facial animations by hand they didn't mocap for silent hill one or two they didn't mocap wow, any shit. of the facial animation that's impressive the um mm -hmm. <clears throat> official playstation magazine they calculated about how long how many days and stuff it would take to render all the cinematics so uh, they they estimated an upward of 2000 hours and that's a minimum of like 83 straight days to make to render all of the cinematics in the uh, first game, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So he he did not go home. No, and the sad thing is that that wasn't even new because the job before that, I think he was working on Twin B or no, it was Sexy Parodius, yeah, and he it. was working on the port, and he was the only artist on the team. Like the work conditions there were pretty miserable. They started production of Silent Hill back in 1996, September 1996. And they wanted to make a Hollywood-style action horror game, and I'm assuming it's because Resident Evil kicked butt when it released in spring mm -hmm. in the West. So they specifically wanted it to make a game for Western audiences. But as Konami usually does, they go, okay, we're going to get pe these people together and throw it to them, and they're just going to make it work. But we're not going to actually put any effort into it. We expect it to be done with little to no help, and it'll be amazing. And a lot of times it wouldn't work, but for this team, that worked in their favor because they did not know how to make a, a B-style horror movie, whatever action game that Konami was looking for. And since Konami corporate and other staff members were losing faith in the project like right away because they were floundering, they didn't know what they were supposed to do, uh, they decided to do their own thing and said, fuck them. We'll, we'll make the kind of game we want to play. So they decided to go towards more the abstract, the fear of the unknown. Uh, AJ, you mentioned earlier that Keicho Toyama, it was his first directing role. Mm -hmm. And he said in a Polygon interview that he doesn't even like horror movies. He's like a big scared, scaredy cat. <laughs> yes, so, he did. <laughs> he, he had to draw from like his own, from his own media that he did like. And it was usually like uh, UFO stories uh, David Lynch films, uh, like cult stuff. So he drew all the horror kind of aspects from his media that he knew and loved, which is why there's so many uh, parallels with like Twin Peaks and uh, other weird. And it's like, like all those like references and stuff mm -hmm. too, like Red Rum mm -hmm. and all the street names. Yeah. So originally, uh, originally he actually wanted to just straight out adapt The Mist by Stephen King but they couldn't get the rights from King. And and so the whole idea, everybody says, oh, they came up with the idea of the fog to fix the graphical problems. Well, it did that, but it originally was because he wanted to just take this book he loved and make it a video game. I didn't know hmm. that. Oh, I didn't know that either. Cool. So things uh, turned around for them once it uh, the opening cinematics, the little trailer that they made for E3 in Atlanta, once that was shown and people were like, oh, holy shit, what game is that? It looks so good. All of a sudden, Konami's like, hey, yeah. we're totally into you guys now. So uh, let's give them funding. And they did all this like promotion and stuff. 
And Silent Hill, uh, even the own team, they weren't sure it was going to be a success. Like, down until its release date, they were like, oh, no, it's going to fail. We're going to get fired. Well, oh, I forgot to mention this. So Team Silent, uh, that was the, the, what they called themselves within uh, Konami. It was uh, 15 or 16 members at the time, and they were all made up of people who failed at their previous projects or didn't fit in with the other teams. And a lot of them were on the brink of quitting already. So these were all the misfits of the entire company come together to make this kind of misfit game. And it worked, you know. I don't know if it could have happened any other way if it wasn't these particular people. I mean, I feel like I feel like that's so much of everything that's great is that it's it, it's born out of just amazingly perfect random ass circumstances. <laughs> I was really taken aback when I found out that they were convinced the game was going to fail. Like, I was like, how could they think that? The game is so awesome. But they had all these I mean, it naysayers. Was, it was like nothing else on the market at the time. I mean, mm -hmm. horror either horror came in two flavors. It was, you know, Resident Evil, which not counting Alone in the Dark was groundbreaking at the time. And like a clock tower kind of experience where it was basically just a text adventure. You no, know, it's point and click. And you have... Yeah, it's point and click. Um, so Silent Hill coming out and being so otherworldly and weird, I yeah, I can I can especially see like the suits being uh, like unsure of that. So uh, I, as you guys know, um, I had to I re revisited Silent Hill after I don't know seventeen years uh, in preparation for the Rely on Horror charity stream last year, and I was really surprised at how well it held up over the last 20 years. And like we were talking about before, it's really hard to believe that San Hill was Takeyoshi Sato's first th real 3D project. The cinematics are still gorgeous, and when compared to CG from other games with bigger teams, like Capcom's Resident Evil 2 and Squaresoft's Parasite Eve, the overall quality is like night and day. I had streamed Resident Evil 2 before the remake's release, and I couldn't believe how awkward all the humans looked in both their features and movements. Kind of dead-eyed, too. I, I don't know, maybe it's just and me. all their hands are, like, they feel like action figures. All their hands are just kind of open-palmed. Mm -hmm. It's really weird looking. And it's just one year prior. So I was just wondering, do you guys feel that the cinematics still hold up, or am I just being super biased? <laughs> no, they look great. They look great, oh, especially... Totally was, I mean, like, PlayStation 1 era, you know, like, pre-rendered cinematics are kind of famous for being a bit horrifying i mean like like tekken one is legitimately creepy looking <laughs> um and you know like resident evil Re well resident evil one doesn't have any resident evil two you know like we're saying is very awkward and stiff looking resident evil three was probably the best looking out of all of them but the all the characters still look very weird and cartoony despite the game's otherwise super realistic aesthetic um so you have like silent hill one comes out and I mean, even to this day, it's clearly head and shoulders above all of its contemporaries in term, in, in that regard of the pre-rendered cinematics. They're great. I mean, just a good example is, is Lisa's death scene. Uh, the way she stumbles and like, it's just, the movements are very fluid when she's moving and yeah. you see her stumbling and then you're like, oh, there, there is something wrong with her because she's jerking a little bit. Just subtle ticks I, I noticed when I was replaying. I was like, wow, he really paid attention to how human body works. But he, he was a, a fine artist, so I'm not really surprised. I will point out that there is currently, and it's a little more with the like, I guess a lot of the indie studios, but there's currently a big market for games made this year or last year that look like they were released in 2001. So they're pushing back towards those same kind of visuals. So not only does it hold up fairly well, it's part of a group of games that were really good for their time. And that's what people are currently trying to replicate. Yeah, hey, I, I totally welcome that because we we had that whole wave of you know eight bit indie games, then thirty two bit indie games. 
get, I bring back that 1990s stuff. I, I think it still holds up, especially cause I remember way back in the day, Whitney, you talked about how when you first started playing 3D video games, that it was really incredible not having to use your imagination as much anymore. And now I actually feel kind of the opposite way is I, I like how much those visuals kind of rely on you being able to fill in certain blanks. And I, I often find with things like Silent Hill 1 and Metal Gear Solid 1 that I end up really falling into their worlds really easily because I don't know, because as much as the game is doing it, I'm also kind of having to pull the legwork as well just because that's the way the visuals are designed. Yeah, I mean, and I do think the low-res graphics kind of work in Silent Hill's favor. It gives more mystery to the town and just what's going to be around the next corner. But another key way I think this game excels is with Akira's sound design. Now, we, we kind of talked about this briefly, but he really did do something new with his Silent Hill work that wasn't seen in games before. I believe he was the first to use industrial sounds as part of a soundtrack. I have a vague memory of people being very surprised about how well it worked at the time. And uh, Silent Hill's graphics are pretty low res, so sound does go a long way into making the tense atmosphere. When I replayed it a few months ago for the first time, I jumped like 10 feet in the air because I was, I was in the sewers and I'm running from hang scratchers, like uh, right after I got the key and you have to run to the door and they're chasing you. And as I'm running, I'm like, okay, I'm almost there. And all of a sudden there's this big shotgun blast. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I jumped in my chair and I'm like, what the heck was that? And it was just a sound that he put in randomly. There was a lot of random sounds that were just like, why is that there? Like another one in the library, when, when you're looking at the books and stuff, you hear like, like knocking sounds or uh, glass breaking in the hospital, like stuff like that. Uh, oh man, that oh, yeah. sound killed me the first time I heard it. Um, it was one of those things where I, I I didn't know what happened. Like I didn't know how to react to it, so I just sort of like freaked out. <laughs> and I think one of the cool things about the industrial sound is it really blurred the line between what was you know ambient noise within the environment of the game itself and what was the actual soundtrack. So you didn't know whether those sounds were supposed to be coming from something where you were, or if it was just sort of, you know, the music. And the more industrial it got, especially with like the rusty, um, is like the sewers, and once you come out uh, of the sewers and it turns into the, uh, the other world, it gets really clangy and really aggressive. And it's just this, this aggressive percussion that just doesn't stop. So if you weren't completely tense before, you're definitely going to be tense when that happens. You're so like, it just it's so loud. It What's up. going on? Because he also chose moments to be silent, and you're like, uh, uh, is something going to happen? No. He gave a he gave okay. a talk recently, a couple of years ago. I forgot where it was. It might have been GDC, where he talked about um, the art of silence and how in including silence within a rhythm up like it subconsciously upsets you so if you have like something that sounds rhythmic and then all of a sudden it stops it just and then continues mm -hmm. yeah it really it really messes with you which I remember yep. in my most recent uh playthrough i didn't get quite to i didn't beat it um but i got uh to the school and it still gets me like just you know just missing a dog getting to a door things like that but specifically with regards to the the sound um and silence school is really aggressive and you have flyers coming at you you have the dogs running after you you make it to that door and as soon as it cuts all the sound drops and there's nothing so you have that little lobby where you pick up the map and you go through the main doors and all you can hear is harry's footsteps and that is completely unsettling i, I was just going to say and, and i don't think the 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 sound design and the music i don't think it's too controversial to say as tremendous as all of Akira's work on the series is. I, th I think that Silent Hill 1 
absolutely has the scariest score of any of them. Like, oh, the I definitely agree. Horror score. The other ones are very melodic, you know, like piano and what. It, it's very like. Yeah, I there's love, a lot of themes. Yeah, I love working to like Silent Hill 2 soundtrack because it's very low key. That game, the whole game is pretty low key now. I think about it. Uh, I find yeah, it, it very, very relaxing. somber. Yeah, but Silent Hill One is like bah, 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 bah. silence. Yeah, well, that's the thing. You know, we we're talking about the use of silence. Is that especially listening to that CD I had where I didn't have context? Mm -hmm. A lot of those tracks would they would start with a very kind of slow, quiet ambient sound and flow into really loud, really scary, you know, like clanks and bangs, <laughs> clanks and bangs and things. And there's one track that I think is what you were talking about, where even on the CD, it just stops dead. And it's the first track on the CD that does that. Every other track flows into the next. Um, and my, but my favorite one, uh, even in the game, um, I don't know what it's called on the CD, but there's um, when you get to the merry-go-round, as it's slowly turning, there's this... The little it, carousel thing? The, the, not the carousel, but um, I can't remember if it's before or after the boss fight. There's just shots of it slowly turning in a cutscene, and it sounds like it sounds like a like a chorus of voices, but it's being synthetically lowered each time, and it just it really unnerves me. I don't know what it is about it, but I find it really creepy. That's the one where Harry's talking about um, Cheryl, being, Cheryl being adopted to Sybil, and that. Yeah. Honestly, I can't. Um, it's hard to imagine what Silent Hill might have been like if it was a more traditional horror score like Resident Evil or something. Um, did you did you guys know that Akira had to actually convince the rest of the team members on his idea for sound? Um, huh. In a 2008 interview with the Swedish Level magazine, Akira recounted that when the score was first implemented into the game, the team was absolutely silent, no, no pun intended, and then someone walked up to the computer and tried to check what was wrong. Huh. <laughs> he had so uh, Akira had to explain that the music was supposed to sound like that, so they were not fans at first. They just thought it was like noise. That gets me about Akira Yamaoka is that he has no formal musical training whatsoever. He cannot read sheet really? music. Yeah, he plays yeah. by ear. He was Holy an shit. art. He was an art student who got a computer for his work that had a free music app on it, basically. And he taught himself and entered a competition and won and got Konami's attention from there. And sa he said, OK, they're offering me a job. I may as well. He never learned anything. Of it. And so it, it's interesting. His music is so different, I think, because his path to music was so different. And he doesn't follow all these traditions because he was never taught. Yeah. That's why there's all those, like, he does a lot of sampling mm -hmm. as well. So he plays oh, with samples and whatnot. Or, or sometimes, this isn't anything against Akira. I love all of his music. But sometimes he'll just reuse a whole damn track. Um, he <laughs> reuses this. I don't know what the name of the track is. He reuses a track from Sound Hill Homecoming in the soundtrack for Shadows of the Damned. And it's literally the same piece. There's no difference. Wait, he does? Yeah. Oh, I need, uh, I'll, I need I'll, to... I'll find them. I'll, I'll go find them. Okay. I would say one thing that hasn't held up too well is the game's clunky controls, but I think that's more due to the change of times with uh, tank controls being out of practice and, and whatnot. Rourke, you are the Resident Evil super fan over on Reliant Horror. Yeah. How did you like Silent Hill's controls in comparison? Did you like being able to run and shoot at the same time? Um, I, I You know, I agree with you. I think that of... If there's anything about Silent Hill 1 that's aged poorly, I definitely think it's the controls. Largely because they are trying to shake off the tank controls of Resident Evil. Which even though, like a lot of people, I'm, I'm always hearing people say, oh, they're really confusing, they're hard to work with. I've never felt that way. I, I, I Like I immediately snap into tank controls. I find them really simple to pick up. Obviously it's because I grew up with them. Yeah, but so you but, grew up with them. So. But Silent Hill... It's, it's interpretation of tank controls throws so many loops at you. Like, really? you know, you, you can bump into shit. There's, there's a oh, lot more. Yes. Yes. When it, like you run, it's hard. He doesn't stop right away when you let go of yeah, your you've run got, button. You've got like he, a little skitter at the he end. He skitters and runs into walls. It's so oh, funny. There's, 
and he's also a lot slower than uh, than most tank control games. Like like Resident Evil, all of your movement speeds are all basically the same. Walking forward is the same speed as walking back. Um, at least until like remake where they gave them different animations. Whereas Silent Hill, he, walking backwards is a little bit slower than walking forward. Um, and all of it feels designed to feel more real, to feel like you're controlling more of a real person. Whereas Resident Evil, they very clearly feel like a video game character. When they turn, they turn like they're on a goddamn turnstile. Their, their body doesn't move. Whereas if I recall, Harry does move when he turns his legs move yeah his legs move. Um, uh and yeah i you know it's not like they're bad or anything but i definitely think that compared to things like resident evil at the time they are harder to pick up just because of all that extra they could have used more polish for their control yeah. scheme yeah i think the tank controls get a little bit of a bad rap i think um when i first played re2 i think that might have been my first introduction to that control scheme and it took me a second, but um, that one direction was always, you know, if you pressed up, that's always going to be forward, and no matter what camera angle you switch to. Um, I think some people might have been confused because, like, Mario 64, it's, you know, um, what is it, camera relative. So if you're pointing towards, you know, a direction, you're going to go that direction. But with Silent Hill, especially in my last um, replay, what I usually do is I'll center... I'll center the camera um, once I've started going in the direction I want to. I think w sometimes with that, the first game is the camera will kind of, s you know, swish, uh, you know, sideways when you're turning, and it can be a little disorienting. But uh, hmm. the control scheme always felt natural to me. I think it's aged a little bit, but I think in comparison to a lot of uh, a lot of games, it's held up pretty well. You mentioned Mario 64. I'd argue that Mario 64's controls have aged like bread. <laughs> they feel really weird and awkward now, at least. Yeah, it's weird how different games age different ways. Like you guys said, I, I mean, I didn't pick up this game uh, until last year, uh, like two weeks before we uh, we did the charity stream. And there was I was at a point where like, Oh my God, if, if I cannot control him very well, I don't know if I can stream this because I was having a hell of a time getting used to tank controls again. Now it's like no problem, but I really thought like, oh God, what if I can't do this for like the first- How long ago had you played it since the stream? Um, uh, 17 years. Wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I watched other people play and whatnot, but I, I hadn't touched it myself in a long time and I was struggling with those controls, but after- an hour or so, I it finally clicked. You know, it was like riding a bike, and I'm like, okay, I got it. I could do this. Did you this. play it on the original PS1, or did you do the PS3 version? Oh, I I um, I um ripped my PS1 game and played it with an emulator on my computer. Okay. Yeah, um, full disclosure, I played it on the PS3, so I guess that's technically an emulation. But besides the uh, R2 and L2, I think everything's just about the same. That's how I played it as well. I think I no, I definitely played it the original PlayStation disc because I found it at a flea market and I felt very happy because it was only like five. When I first played it, I for, I, I actually played it on the um the the original PlayStation cr controller which didn't have a rumble feature. I only got that one later on, and that was awesome because um just how Metal Gear did cool things with it. With this one, the lower Harry's health got, it would actually you know his heartbeat would rumble louder and louder, and so the you're like oh no, I gotta vibrate. I gotta heal him. <laughs> It's the health drink message. Mm -hmm. So, besides, I guess, controls, were there any other negatives for you guys with the game that you can think of? I mean, I thought the map was really good. I liked how Harry marked where he was going. That oh, was, that like was so cool. Yeah. That was so cool. Especially, you know, because I played all the Resident Evils before that. In Resident Evil, if, like, a room gets locked off, the door just turns red. But in Silent Hill, having him actually, like, have a little red Sharpie and making notes on the map and shit. So that was helpful. so cool. I really dug that. Especially since most of the doors were jammed or locked or whatever. It was good that you can look at your map and go, okay, all these doors do not work. That door works. Let's go back to that door. That's I also right. really love that he'll, like, occasionally just scribble on the map. He's like, like, no. It's, it's all gone. <laughs> <laughs> the road is gone. <laughs> yeah, I always thought it was cool. The little scribblings give it a nice little uh, personal touch. And I don't think this is a, a negative more than an observation, but replaying it on the PS3 recently, I noticed the button layout was a little different than what we're used to now. 
I remember I kept pressing pressed it was the wrong thing. So I went when I wanted to go to the menu, I'd pull up the map, and when I wanted to um, run, I'd press the wrong button. So I think um, some of the button layout um, just in general has changed with what we're used to. But like I said, that's I think that's more of an observation of a of a change rather than a negative. I'm having that issue with Dino Crisis right now. I keep trying to do Silent Hill moves, and it's it's completely wrong, Whitney. <laughs> the only thing I really found that was a flaw that took me out of the experience was the voice acting at times. Because there's some really great lines and some really good deliveries, and then there's some really weird ones. The time it kinda... is nigh! It's like yes. nay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which was actually, <laughs> that was actually quoted in one review of the game back in like 99 was the time is nay. <laughs> Apparently people love that. Um, but like there's some really great scenes. Like I love the scene on the carousel where he's explaining that Cheryl was adopted. And, and the the, uh, the the part in the amusement park where Dahlia's showing her divine, like her horrible plan. But yeah, there, it, it's not, it's not the same throughout there are some some bad eggs what's that huh radio what's going on with that radio it's all gold to me oh but william william you you asked uh, michael gwynn about the whole weird pause between lines yeah so um when he was in japan um it's interesting because um I think Jeremy Blostein in a, a recent podcast kind of elaborated on this. Um, Japanese developers typically don't do that, where um, they don't seek out like English speaking uh, people for voices in their games. That's kind of a, a weird thing to do, he said. And there's not that big of a pool, at least back in the early or, you know, mid, mid to late 90s, early 2000s. There wasn't a ton of. Um, uh, English, you know, actors um, or, or English-speaking people that were in the business of voice. So, um, with the first game, you kind of got a mix of, uh, you know, professional voice actor, w- which Michael was, but then you'd also have um, people of various talents. So I think that's why we ended up um, with with different le- different levels of, of performances. But speaking to that pause thing, for me, makes the game. Like I said, it's kind of it's all gold to me. Like, if you m- remove one part of it, then it's not the same kind of a thing. And um, this is kind of a tangent, but it, it, it connects back to it. I've uh, recently got into sort of watching bad movies, and I've, I've graduated from watching them, ironically, to, like, genuinely enjoying them. So at this point, like, a, a good bad movie to me brings me just as much joy as a really good movie. I agree with that. For Silent Hill, like The Room or something like that, like, oh, yeah, it's awful. Well, it was awful the first couple times I saw it, but now I, like, I kind of love it in, like, a realistic <laughs> way. You are lying. I never hit you. You are tearing me apart, Lisa. I say that Silent Hill is any, any close to something like that, but I think a lot of people, I think Resident Evil, the voice acting in the first one, really, uh, not not just noticeable, but it's, it's distracting. Like, is that a human talking or is that some kind of algorithm? Like, who would choose? What is this? Wow, what a mansion! Captain Wesker, where's Chris? Stop it! Don't open that door! But Chris is... What is it? Maybe it's Chris. Now, Jill, can you go? I'm going with you. Chris is our old partner, you know. Okay, let me handle this. I think you have like a Canadian twang on some of the lines, so it's just like, what is going on? But with um, but with the voice acting in Silent Hill, supposedly were something the voice director um gave to Mr. Gwynn, and he said, you know, uh, I believe the direction was we're going to take him out later in post. Um, the theory, his theory was that because of the Japanese sound designers or the the developers who were doing the edits weren't that familiar with that language. They needed clear breaks to know when to edit it. And I don't know if they either ran out of time, somebody forgot, or I don't know what. Maybe they just didn't know to take those out later. or for, I don't know. So Maybe we have... they just really liked Shatner, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Shatner the whole way through then. But so, yeah. see, for me, I always thought that was like maybe a technical thing. But he said, no, live, we would say a line. And then we would say a line again, mm-hmm. a deliberate pause, 
And again, for me, that kind of it makes the game. Um, people always Dahlia, say it gives like a Dahlia, dreamlike you know, quality. That, yeah. that that's what people claim. <clears throat> her over-the-top monologues and stuff like that. Those are all flavors, you know? I, she I guess you could she was hamming it up. She had a great fun with that role. I love Dahlia. And I love Dahlia is pretty amazing. There's a juxtaposition between Harry's every everyday, every man kind of character and her, like, way over-the-top, you know, her delivery. So you have lots of different flavors in this, this great mix. I also liked how every time she came on, on screen, Harry was like, Dahlia Gillespie. He said her full mm-hmm. name. Like, mm-hmm. all, it wasn't just Dahlia. It was like, Dahlia Gillespie. The demon is awakening, spreading those wings. Dahlia Gillespie. We meet at last, Alessa. <gasps> Dahlia Gillespie? Where's Cheryl? Where is she? You we stop all know some- running towards that store right now. <laughs> yeah. We all know somebody like that where their name is just their full name. Oh, uh, well, not me, but... Did he say it one time when he got to the boathouse? Isn't one of the first times he said it there? He, oh, he did. He did goes to Dahlia. But then he goes back to Dahlia Gillespie. I remember uh, one time, I think she says something, and he's like, Dahlia Gillespie, like, you... You motherfucker. She's back. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think my favorite line that just kind of th- threw me off a little bit was, must be drugs. Darkness devouring the town. Must be on drugs. <laughs> that <laughs> it's so it's odd like sounding. <laughs> yes, the first time playing this game, it just kind of comes out of left field. Like I know how it ties into the story now, but her just going must, must be, be drugs. drugs. I'm like, whoa, Sybil, where did that come from? <laughs> I mean, I yeah. if brain. I came into a city and what's going on in Silent Hill is going on, I'm gonna the first thing that comes to mind is gonna be drugs mm-hmm. <laughs> lots of them many flavors uh, i'm gonna get to the drug stuff in a, a little bit but since we, we've already talked about development sound controls let's dive a bit into the game's plot and story i want to know what was your reaction when you first completed the game which ending did you get and were you disappointed that so much was left unexplained so i I got the good plus ending, so I was also following a Game Facts guide, so I guess it's cheating, but I wanted the best ending, and so I was satisfied. What about you guys? I got the same ending, but that's because we had the, like, I, I guess at the time that's what it would have been, the big, chunky, like, send it to the library when you're done book of a guide. Um which I actually saw recently at the library. I guess it's like actually magazine sized, but you wouldn't even think that now looking at the guides we have online. And there was somebody like reading it out to me as I'm playing. My mom was reading out the guide to me while while I was playing. See, that's the thing. Kids today will never understand having to have somebody else sit there and read a guide to you. Well, it's like, it was just us. (laughs) And I'm like, and she's like, what are you going to play? I'm like, Silent Hill. And she's like, oh, I said, you want to watch me? She's like, okay. And I'm like, okay, read this to me. Isn't there like a huge issue with the Prima yes. guide? Oh, there is many issues with that guide. <laughs> um, one, they tell you to get the UFO ending. You just need to uh, use the UFO, uh, the channeling stone at the school and the docks. And they say, that's how you get the ending. Uh, they tell you that the uh, some things are in the wrong place. Like, not all the items are there. Uh, their puzzle solutions are not very helpful. Oh, yeah, th- I'm sure we'll get into that. But yeah, fuck that piano puzzle. It's actually not that bad. <laughs> it's not that bad. It's not that bad if it's been like three years and you don't know a goddamn thing about p- playing piano and you're stuck at work with no Wi-Fi and Silent Hill 1 on a Vita and nothing else. I have a funny story about that puzzle. Uh, the first time I actually made headway on that puzzle when I was younger, uh, I thought I was actually about to solve it because the screen warped <laughs> on the TV. Uh-huh. And then the New York City blackout happened. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> no. Yep. Oh, my God. Oh, no. And I was like, oh, what happened? Did I, what, did I break it? Nope. It was just the entire city lost power for two days. I mean, but you guys get the puzzle now, right? 
I think I like it, I, but I've I, also no. always had it with like the the birds thing. I don't know if there's another way to. Okay, the, you're given a poem. They give you white birds and black birds. So you just have to know yeah. what, what color each bird that's listed. And you go in the order of the poem. So like they say, a pelican flew as fast as he can. So that's going to be the first white clee that uh, the, the furthest away key to the right that clicks. There's only like five keys that will click for you. So out of those keys, you take out from the poem. Oh, the next bird is a crow and it flew higher than this other bird. And you just kind of point. You just take away the flowery languages. You got colors and distance put in that poem. Take the color and the distance and the order given. And there you go. Okay, Whitney, who's editing the podcast here? My explanation was not clear, so I thought I would restate things. Each bird in the poem represents one of the five keys that make a clicking sound on the piano. The white birds listed in the poem represent the three white keys, and the two black birds represent the two black keys. Essentially, you just push one of the keys that clicks in the order of the birds listed in the poem and use the distance described that the bird traveled to figure out the key's placement on the board. So, for example, the first bird in the poem is a pelican, and it came quickly to a stop. Pelicans are white, so the first key we would need to push would be the leftmost white key on the board that clicks. The next bird in the poem was a dove that flew as far as he could, so we would need to push another white key, but since it flew far, it would be the furthest white key to the right of the board that clicks. And on and on. Easy, right? So many I... magazines back in the day complained about that poem endlessly. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I would say that it becomes simple once you once you get it. But I, I feel like the very first time, yeah, you, I know for a fact it's like, what the fuck? Oh yeah, I'm not well, saying I had to Google it. I, it it, it um, took it took me. Like I said, I was playing with a guide, so I knew what to push. But when sure. I was Looking at the poem, and because people brought this up over the years about how hard the the puzzle was, and like I said, I was doing my my let's play. I'm like, I gotta explain this puzzle, and I'm reading it. And I'm like, oh, it is super easy. We're just getting distracted by the flowery language, but it's just well, I I, I, I think I got it's definitely... turned around the first time I played it. Um, we ended up I was playing in college and we ended up having like three music majors in the room and it was like 1:30 and we had gotten ourselves completely turned around because either we weren't paying close enough attention to the words but we kept doing the keys that were making a sound mm. even though the name of the poem is a song with was it uh, a song without a voice or birds without a song or something like that Yeah yeah So we were yeah. just trying every everything possible but uh birds without a voice yeah. So it's the keys that don't make a noise. Yeah, we finally got that. I I don't think we looked it up. I think somehow we finally got it right. Maybe one of the music majors cracked it. But I remember even at the time, I think, again, yeah, looking back, it's probably easy to figure it out. I mean, I, that's, that's, the, abstract. that's the thing with that puzzle is at least it's just a combination. You just If you know the combination, you put the combination in. N nothing will ever, will ever beat the Resident Evil 3 water treatment puzzle. A tale of birds not, without a just... voice. That's the name. Sorry. I, I, I wanted to make sure we got the actual name of the puzzle uh, right. So I got you. Yeah. Um, but I did ask a question. So what was your first sending and what did you guys feel about it? Were you disappointed about things left unexplained? Just curious. Uh, my first time beating it, you know, it was years after the other games had come out. So there wasn't really a chance for me to not know the resolution like i guess there wasn't a feeling of beating it and being like no tell me more but i did get the bad ending where sybil died and i didn't do the side quest because i played without a guide and i didn't know any of that and i was so angry looking it up afterward like there wasn't any like no clue at all no note no hint i had no idea i was so angry you're just supposed to explore and find it yeah and i just didn't i didn't end up stumbling on it the mm -hmm. bottle thing was the one that got me i i i figured i just didn't explore enough and find the side quest but i couldn't believe that i hadn't realized i could pick up liquid off the floor <laughs> 
but otherwise I loved the game. So you got you got the bad bad ending where he died in mm-hmm. the jeep. Yeah. William, you said yours was the the bad ending as well. Yeah, basically I had the same thing where I missed the the bottle in the hospital, uh, missed the motorcycle, and I don't know how, but completely bypassed any Kaufman stuff. Like I didn't even know he was in the latter half of the game. Well, if you miss if you miss the bottle in the hospital, you've missed it completely. Yeah. There is a bottle on the motorcycle, but it's taken away from you. Okay, yeah, the Indian Runner stuff, I think we went there, but, like, the Annie's Bar section didn't even go in. And um, at the amusement park, where when you fight Sybil, I was at her, and, and my buddy was like, I don't think you're supposed to kill her, dude. And I was like, how do you, I mean, am I going to stab her to death? Like, I don't have any, like, items to do anything with. Um, I think we did have to look that up or, or find that out some other way. But yeah, so we played it um, till the end, and um, he, yeah, Sybil dies, and, and Harry wakes up in the jeep, and so I guess is that the bad or the bad plus? It's ending? bad. It's bad. If he's dead in the jeep, it's bad. Bad uh, plus yeah, so usually got... is bad. <laughs> it's really bad. <laughs> bad plus is uh, Sybil lives, and after the credits roll you'll sh- she'll run up to harry they're both like trapped in nowhere with the fire coming down because he kills That's the incubator right. and she slaps him and then they just stand there while yeah. things are coming down yeah i want on a t-shirt that line you just said whitney of if he's dead in a jeep it's bad <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> with like like a little cartoon <laughs> drawing of his red jeep <laughs> yeah i got the jeep ending and um i kind of loved it um, and I, that's still my favorite ending. Um, you can debate what's canon and what's not. I mean, but um, I love that ending, and it really it, it still feels right to me. It feels right with the rest of the game. I think it's one of the m- more creative endings. Um, and how would it tie into Silent Hill Three? Well, there was no Silent Hill Three at the time, so I, I, no, no, no. I know that. I know that. But I meant you said it's still your favorite ending now. So I was wondering, like, oh, well, then how do you reconcile? Silent Hill 3. No, I just mean, I just mean, you know, just the way I feel about oh. it. Like, obviously, you, you know. Like, you like the Jacob's Ladder type of uh, no, connection. It's, it's, you know, Twilight Zone, Jacob's Ladder, and uh, to talk about, you know, your point about uh, needing more answers, but uh, I always, I had kind of a, a love-hate relationship with the game when I first played it, because it, it genuinely freaked me out. I never had one nightmare while playing it, but I never wanted to go to bed, so that was kind of ironic, but... <laughs> When I was playing it, I, w- I was always dreading the next corner, but I was compelled to play on just to find out what the hell was going on in the town. So I needed to know why things the way they were and to get answers. But was sort of wanting that, but not really being satisfied by that. And I think that was one of the points about this one versus something like Resident Evil or something that's a little more broad was I think Silent Hill was so effective because it excelled at the, at the abstract, both visually and story-wise. Um, well, the they, also, that- they also... Uh, made it kind of vague and confusing on purpose. Like they made things contradict themselves. Right, and they purpose. actually took out points of the story that maybe explain too much on mm-hmm. purpose. Um, and I thought that was incredible. I always thought the root of why the town was evil was always less interesting than the fact that it was simply evil. And I think half of the fun was exploring for those answers, but never finding them. So, and I think that bad ending is, is the epitome of that. Um, it's like the good ending still leaves you well, what about the drugs and you know the town and the cops and stuff like that? So you don't you don't get like those answers either, uh, but you get just enough to get your your imagination going, and that's what I've always appreciated with the series in general. Well, I feel like that's definitely kind of how Team Silent saw it: is that you come out of Silent Hill One feeling like the most interesting character is the town itself, and that's I think that's definitely why the rest of the series, for the most part, is mostly just about kind of learning more about not necessarily the history of the town but just the town in in a general and i think the first game took place during a time before everything was set in stone and the the rules of the town had yet to be firmly established oh yeah they didn't they didn't really start it wasn't until um talk um sato when he was on uh doing silent hill 2 He's the one that actually thought about how to kind of connect with the first game, kind of right. expand the whole um, storyline of the town. Like, they didn't really have any ideas outside of, you know, hey, there's this stuff going on. They didn't think too hard about it because they weren't expecting to get a sequel. They thought it was going to fail. 
So I think he, a lot of people might not remember that before too. I mean, there wasn't anything about specifically, at least, the town manifesting people's worst fears and making them real and all that stuff, or the place of the silent spirits. Before that, it was just a quiet, lonely resort town, and everything was wide open story-wise. So when you're playing that first game, if you're not familiar with the series or maybe know, know about the, the stories of the, the sequels, it's just, you know, this weird town where stuff's going on, and it, it pretty much boils down to that the father's his, that one father's search for his daughter, and that's kind of the motivation for the entire game. Yeah. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the drug stuff. Uh, Rourke, you mentioned this a little earlier, but I remember uh, when I was discussing the drug side plot on Twitter last year, I was really surprised to learn that a lot of my friends didn't know it existed. Um, I think It's hard. It, it's very easy to miss. Um, I, I think following all the little clues, starting with the notes in the police department about Officer Gucci's death and using the items in Kaufman's dropped wallet was one of the most enjoyable bits of the game. And I was kind of sad the cult's drug production hasn't been brought up within the other games. So what were your guys' thoughts on the side mission? I know a lot of you skipped over it, but d did you, you guys ever... Purpose. Well, did you ever watch like a playthrough of the side mission no. stuff? I, 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 you know, I, I do want to watch your playthrough at some point. I've never watched a playthrough of Silent Hill One. Oh, well, uh, I, I literally only know that mission existed because you told me about it. <laughs> um, yeah, I literally, I'd never gone in the police station. I'd never gone into like the bar that Kaufman's in, a restaurant, or whatever the hell it is. The the like apartment building where there's the motorcycle. I didn't do any of that shit. Okay, so I guess should I give a little summary of the uh, side mission for people maybe yeah, who doesn't go know? Yeah, for it. Okay, so you go through the sewers and you pop up in the resort area of Silent Hill. You're like, yay, you made it to your vacation. Well, the game doesn't really tell you where to go next. Your options are limited because all the roads are kind of blocked off. The only thing that's really highlighted is the lighthouse little area. So you sort of, you can just go down the street, keep going down, and then make your way to a boat. And then from there, you're in the end game, sort of stuff. But if you explored, you might run into a bar and see a little cutscene of Kaufman fighting for his life against a, um, excuse me, <clears throat> Mumbler. Sorry, I couldn't think of the, of the name really fast. Mumbler. Uh, it's kicking his butt. And Harry, badass that he is, he takes out his gun. Lines up a shot and kills it in one shot. I wish I could do that during the game. And you save him. And he's like, oh, yeah, uh, thanks. What are you doing? Like, goofing off. Okay, I gotta go. Business calls or whatever. And he leaves. But he leaves his wallet behind. And Harry's like, oh, what's this? Finders Keepers opens it up. He finds a receipt with a code on it. A motel key. And he's like, okay. So you could just go to the boat if you want to, but if you check out the receipt, it's a familiar name on top, the Indian Runner. So you run up to the Indian Runner, there's a lock on the door. You unlock it with the code that's written on the receipt. Inside, it's like a, a, a general store. Goods are strewn all over the ground. But if you go around the corner, there's this journal on top and a safe. The safe's locked. But if you just look in the drawer next to where you're standing, you'll find the safe key and you open it up and he goes, it's drugs. And that's it. He, he doesn't say anything else about the drugs. But you see uh, these white uh, packs of, of some sort of powder substance. And he's like, it's drugs. I'm not going to take it with me for some reason, but there you go. But the he, little... So he, he took the wallet, but not not the bag of powder. Yeah, he doesn't... He, he, did, he doesn't do drugs, he guys. Up. He scooped up red shit off the floor of an elementary school, but he's he, he leaves the drugs that he's assumed are drugs without opening the bag. Well, yeah, you know what? He dare he took dare. He knew he was against it, so he didn't want to even yeah, touch what it. What are you going to do with a bag of white powder anyway in a town like that, right? <laughs> That's never going to come in handy. <laughs> your, little, your little scavenger hunt kind of continues because there's this journal, and you open it up, and it's this guy's, I guess, diary. And he says, that guy came uh, over again. I gave him the package the woman left. And then he goes on to say, I don't like working with them, 
but I'm afraid if I try to leave, something might happen to me. So he's, this guy at the Indian Runner is some sort of middleman for uh, the drugs that are in the safe. So someone comes, drops them off, and then he hands it off to a man. And you're like, huh, okay, sounds weird. You turn, oh, and he also writes that um, he, that man show, is showing up at Norman's too, which if you turn around to the wall, there's a photo on the grand opening of Norman's Motel. And then there's like a little door code left in a please drop at the back entrance, three eggs, eight eggs, whatever. It's a number combination. And you're like, wait a minute. What was that key I picked up? And you look at it. It's a motel key. Room number three. So you're like, okay, let's go check out that motel. You go running down the street. You get to that back door, put in the code, open up. You're like, oh, this is nice and dingy hotel. You go into the garage. You see a motorcycle. You're like, oh. I wish that would work. I could get the hell out of here, but it doesn't. It's all dusty, though, except for the gas cap. For some reason, everything else is covered in dust, but that gas cap. So you're thinking, why is that? There's something in there. So you take uh, Kaufman's key. You go into his motel room. Not much to see, but for some reason, you notice that there's this hole in the floor. And if you move the dresser out of the way, you could see it. And there's a key there, but you but you can't you can't get to it. His hands are too big; he can't reach it and get it. But luckily, someone left some magnet connected to a, a a wire in the reception area. So you grab that, get the key. It's a motorcycle key. You go back to the garage. You're like, all right, I'm gonna find out what's in there. You open it up. It's the bottle of the red stuff you saw in the uh, hospital. So if you didn't pick up, you're probably thinking at that moment, oh good, I got the mysterious stuff that spilled. But then here comes Kaufman, and he yells at you, and he snatches it away, tells you to mind your business, and stomps away. And then he cuss at you too. No, he. Well, does he cuss? Can't remember off the I, top. I, of I, him. I, I seem to, somebody swears in. in oh, fuck it, <laughs> it's cussing the whole time here. But I remember somebody swearing in Silent Hill One, and it kind of shocking me because you really don't hear swear words in PlayStation One games very often. Well, they say even hell. They say hell, but oh, yeah. I don't think that's, um, he says stop flopping our gums and some other shit, but then he stomps away, he snatches out your hand, and then Harry's just like, well, that was a waste of time, but it wasn't. Yeah. It was not a waste of time, Harry, because it connects to the cult drug stuff. So essentially that backstory is the cult, um, is producing and selling white Claudia, to Taurus mainly, which is what Sybil brought up very awkwardly in the antique shop, where she's like, it must be drugs, and they're investigating it. So they have part of the town and the tourists, they're getting them hooked on this drugs, I guess making money, that's how they were making their money. But the police were having a hard time cracking down on their operation. And this is because the cult was using uh, the powers from Melissa with the god inside her to kill people. They killed a mayor and they killed Officer Gucci, who was investigating the narcotics stuff. Um, so that's how Kaufman gets in there. He's the dealer around the town, which you're supposed to guess from the, the little journal in the Indian Runner. So I, I found listening to other people talk about the drug stuff, they might find the notes in the police department and then Sybil's comments and be wondering what the hell it has to do with anything, it's because they missed out on this side mission, which I thought was really cool. Because it's a, it's an important plot point that a lot of people miss. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I missed it the first time, and that I, I wish I had discovered it on my own without having to be told about it. Because you're right, it is, it is I think, important to that game's story, and it, I don't know, it adds a whole nother layer to what's going on, like, even without... The, in like a, even like a metaphorical sense, because um, it's something I always really liked, and I've always felt that the quote was just like a marketing blurb, but on the back of the CD case, it says something like, every town has secrets, some are just darker than others, mm -hmm. something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And I always, you know, I, I only found that quest like a year or two ago, and I remember feeling distinctly that kind of Twin Peaksy vibe of like, because like the the Silent Hill movie is just like, oh, they're just a crazy Christian cult and they did one bad thing and it went really bad. Whereas the game 
really kind of emphasizes like even without the scary demon shit, even without the cult shit, this town really isn't worth saving, or at least these specific people are. They're horrible people. Yes, they're, they are. They deserve to be damned. So this kind of goes into my next question. I have to ask this. Are you guys for the boiler theory? Or not? No. 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 <laughs> Dahlia's, Dahlia's a, a bad, crazy person who's like has like cats all over her body that you just don't know because they're underneath her crazy clothes. <laughs> No, she's um, horrible. But then why would anyone take cat, her what she says at face gone. value? Yeah, I think I personally I think the game makes it pretty clear that Dahlia burned Alessa alive for the impregnation ritual. Um, I don't understand people's st getting stuck on this. For some reason, they want to believe. The, uh, news the newspaper from seven years ago that's found in nowhere, only if you play the PAL and Japanese re-release versions. For some reason, it doesn't appear in the U.S. copy. This newspaper describes the night of the fire and how the police found Alyssa's, Alyssa's uh, uh, charred body. And then they said, well, we're going to investigate. Oh, it looks like it was uh, due to an antiquated boiler. End of investigation. Police investigations have never been wrong. <laughs> I think that's an example of, of contradictory evidence. Like you're given, you know, you're given two things. Obviously, the U.S. version didn't get that, but that is a very kind of PR spin on it, as opposed to no, it was actually a cult that burned a child. They're probably yeah. not going to tell you that version, um, even if they knew it. But I think that's that's another great way of. of of creating a discussion, um, it kind of doesn't make sense if you literally take that to heart. But I think it's cool that the game kind of gives you an alternate take on that. You know, this is what you find out, but you know, or this is what you read, and then later on you find out it's it's much different. You know, it's interesting that you're talking about. You know, do you believe in the in the boiler room theory? I, I feel like every game has something like that. That there's some aspect to it that fans get really into that they they like discussing. You know, Silent Hill 1, it's the boiler room. With Silent Hill 2, is marrying James Trunk. Silent Hill 4, did he get his j dick chopped off? You know, it's there's, there's always some <laughs> little... That took, a beat. that took a beat. I was really afraid nobody would laugh. But... <laughs> um, okay, for people wondering, he's talking about the circumcision theory. Walt, um, yeah, Walter being circumcised. Circumcision meltdown. <laughs> oh, my yeah. God. Um, oh, that's for another podcast. <laughs> yeah, I um, I guess I guess this would be a better question for origin for when we talk about origins, but I feel it would be interesting to talk about it here too. I guess, do you feel that the retroactive information that origins added to this stuff damages? Well, no, because the origins origins flat out says it was a cult cover up, but a lot of people sure. I I I, I mean in like the broader sense of like that that Alyssa was burned down in her house that it, it like strongly suggests that um lisa was sleeping with kaufman stuff okay i'm gonna get i'm gonna get into the lisa stuff um in, in, a, in a moment but i i want to i want to talk more about the the night of the fire um i think origins uh people are mad because of lisa's characterization of course and then it also says hey that newspaper article Dahlia is a horrible woman, and she burned her, her child alive, which I thought was pretty clear in the first game, but I guess it isn't. Um, I, I talked a little bit about this in in my uh, recap video at the end of my Let's Play, but I, I talked about how there are in-game hints that Dahlia burned Alyssa alive. Alyssa alive. Um, when you're in the school and you go into the boiler room and you're lowered down to fight uh, the, the split head. You see a person in the ceremonial robes of the cult go up in flames. And then you fight the big um, blizzard. But then later on in the other church, when you turn to leave again, you'll see uh, the painting of Incubus the thing underneath it suddenly shoots up flames and it engulfs uh, Incubus. I just feel that that's like, hey, you guys, fire is a big part of this whole ritual. 
And oh, no, for, I wasn't disagreeing with you. I was saying that it, that Origins, at least to me, it, I, I, I guess I'm, it's because the movie is influencing me. But in Silent Hill 1, I always, you know, it was a cult that burned her alive. I always kind of got more of like a culty ritual thing about it. Whereas Origins is, Origins kind of comes off as like, oh, she just threw a match at the wall. No, no, no. It, it was, it was a ritual. That was okay. how, that's how the god got inside of her. Without burning her alive, she wouldn't have gotten the fetus implanted. Okay. Okay. Um, I kind of always got the impression that it was a cover up and that the it, the fire was part of the ritual because fire in symbology is always a transformative magic substance. Like it, it is a way of transforming. And so the idea that she's becoming the vessel of God that's going to transform the world, well, duh, a fire is the perfect image of how to, you know, cast a spell that's going to change her into this like a phoenix out of the ashes mm -hmm. yeah, yeah exactly so i i guess like a short summary of of what happened was the cult there there they wanted to bring forth their god for a while i don't really understand their motivations but from what dahlia says uh in the bad endings she wants to uh cleanse the world with fire but I think she wanted to use the god more for her own greed. So they failed. They would snatch women. This is found in the uh, uh, back of the complete Japanese guide that was translated. They had a Q&A section. It's, the answers aren't attributed to a, a, pers a single person on the staff. But since it is an official Konami guide, made uh, released when the game was released i assume they talked to the story people because it sounds like all the answers are very detailed so there was some more background giving in that guide and apparently the cult were trying to birth their god for a long time snatching women so a lot of people were going missing and failing over and over and over again because they died uh dahlia then got the idea that oh my daughter is kind of powerful she has some of my abilities it's not like overt abilities, but she has some psychic powers, which they retconned a bit in Silent Hill 3, saying that she could kill people with a thought. But I'm not sure if that's before or after she had the god in her. Um, so she decided to use her own daughter as a sacrifice, well, not a sacrifice, but in the ritual because it was a high chance of her surviving. And she was right. Once uh, the god, when she performed the ritual, whatever it did, it worked. The fetus was put into her womb, but Alyssa was not down with this. She did not want God to come. She was sort of, fuck the cult, fuck my mom. And so she tried to put a stop to it by splitting her soul. Because without her full soul, Incubus could never be uh, born. So, oh, um, oh. Uh, uh, just a quick question, because this is something I've never been clear on. Sand Hill Origins Alessa looks like she's like eight years old. This the Alessa that like the ghost Alessa that we see in one that's like walking around the boiler room looks like maybe fifteen. She's fourteen. Why? She's fourteen. She's fourteen. She's astral projecting herself. She's still alive. She's um okay. When you get to nowhere and you're about to uh, Dahlia is talking. There's two. There's the astral projection uh, Alessa, and then there's someone in a wheelchair. Okay. It's, uh, uh, in robes, that is the real Alessa. I'm uh, I'm learning shit every day. <laughs> okay. So okay, I guess I should rewind a bit. So when you get to town, right? You're with you're with Cheryl. She uh she was the one that wanted to go to Silent Hill, but she didn't know at the time. The reason that she was so eager to go is because there's something in the back of her mind of someone needing help, like. It wasn't overt, but she just knew that she needed to go because someone needed her help. So she really wasn't wanted to... screaming Silent Hill out in the field. No, mm -hmm. it was not. Uh, so she asked her dad to go to Silent Hill. And as soon as they crossed the town limits, um, she went running out of the car looking uh, kind of like in a trance because she's the other half of Alyssa's soul. Alyssa's holed up somewhere uh, wrapped in bandages, bandages and whatnot. But at some point early on in the game, they, the soul comes together because Cheryl's essentially just another part of her soul in human form. They combine, Alyssa has her full soul, 
which means she has her full powers and she breaks out of the binding spell that Dahlia put her under. She now has a god inside of her. She can wreak havoc if she wanted to. So her main goal during that whole game, she was setting uh, seal, all the seals around town. It was to annihilate herself because she knew she could not kill herself in any other method because she had a god in her. The god would not let her die. She had fatal burns on her body when she was seven years old and she still lived in pain because the god wouldn't let her die. So she was trying to kill herself that entire game. Um, they said, at least in the guide, uh, the Japanese guidebook, that she might have been mistaken about this spell. She thought it, it would annihilate her, but it might have annihilated the entire town and everybody in it as well. So I guess it's a good thing Harry stopped her with the with flowers getting tricked by Dahlia. But her goal in that game was to kill herself. Point blank. Okay. And one more time. I kind of misspoke here. According to the Japanese Complete Guide uh, staff Q&A, Alessa might have been mistaken as to the Seal of Metatron's true powers. It might not have resulted in an annihilation spell at all. What I was trying to say here was I still thought it was lucky that Harry still got tricked because you never know, it, it could have resulted in that. Plus, in doing so, some part of Alessa ends up getting another chance to live a happy life. And Dahlia was like, oh, hell no. We, uh, I, I can't get close to her now. I'm, I'm, she's broken from my spell, our spell. I can't get close to her. She will stop me. I have to trick this other dude to get close enough to her so the florist would activate and bind her powers again. Which is why things start uh, going shit with nowhere. With Lisa and stuff. Okay. So, I always thought that we were just seeing a ghost. I didn't know she's mm -mm. still... Well, it, I guess it's kind of a... It's an astral like, projection. I mean, that's her... 14 She's years old. She's alive in the opening cutscene when she wakes up in the bandages. That's that's current. That's not a flashback. So okay. Yeah, that's current. I think that's her. And then she, she, she shows up in the wheelchair at the very end. Mm -hmm. all, all covered up with the... So you know those all those hanging bodies you see everywhere uh, around yeah. town? They look like they're in a straight jacket of some sort. The, those yeah. are the ceremonial robes of the cult. So that's why Alyssa, uh, at the end, Dahlia wants to complete the ritual. She wants God to be born, so she's trying. It's basically the 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 ritual was on pause for seven years while they awaited their soul's return. So I I didn't go over this, but okay. So seven year old Alessa, she survived. Her soul was made into a baby on the side of the road that Harry and his wife picked up and then adopted and had a happy life. Without that soul, they cannot birth the god. So Dahlia's like, well, shit, what are we going to do now? I mean, the baby could be anywhere. You know, how do we uh, tell the soul to come back? Well, she realized if she tortured Alessa enough, she would get to a point where she couldn't stand it anymore and would beg the other half of her soul to come back. So for seven years, she was kept in the hospital basement and pretty much tortured until she finally broke down and called for Cheryl because... Alyssa at that point was like, you know, at least a part of me is living a good life. I don't want her to come back. I don't want the god to be born. So Dahlia was basically torturing, torturing her daughter. I mean, she couldn't well, die. That shit's way worse than I thought it was. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Ch trying to convince her to call for the other half of her soul. And it, it worked. Uh, Cheryl came. And at that point, Alyssa, Alyssa's like, I just want to fucking die. <laughs> you know, I'm tired of this shit. So that was Dahlia's plan. Uh, oh, oh, and while and while Alyssa was in, you know, uh, coma, deep sleep, whatever, it seemed like she woke up at times. But while she was stuck in the basement, the there was still a bit of the god in her, just in a, a not in its full powers. They're able to draw from her the god powers, which is what they use to kill the mayor and the uh, uh, Gucci, officer Gucci. So Officer Gucci and the mayor, it was claimed that they died of a heart problem when, well, at least Gucci, it said in his uh, little note in the police station that he died of 
some heart condition, but he had no history of heart problems. So he had a heart attack or something. They drew on the God's power within Alessa at that point to do it. So uh, there seems to be another motivation with the cult using the God for their own gains in terms of politics and making money and all that stuff. So I'm not sure it's really to create par uh, paradise like Claudia wanted. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, one last lore question, because I'm clearly not anywhere near as well informed about this game as I thought I was. Um, does Is there any information as to who Alessa's father is? Cause... No. No, we don't okay. know. The, uh... the movie seems to kind of insinuate, I mean, obviously the movie's its own thing, but it, it seems to kind of insinuate that I that the the church wants to burn her because she was born out of wedlock. That's what yeah, that's what like I, that's that. what I got from the movie. It was she's born out of she's born out of sin. Mm -hmm. So they yeah, or 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 maybe she the the midichlorians just came together. To create... <laughs> <laughs> she's horror Jesus. <laughs> this is kind of a a good segue for a thought I've had, and and maybe see what y'all think. Mm -hmm. I kind of always got the impression because of the way that the story is designed and the characters we meet, that Kaufman would be the person to make the most sense. Oh. Because to me... Yeah, I like well, this. Yes, I, I don't know as, as much about uh, some of the stuff you were saying about uh, she decided later to choose her daughter. I kind of always had this idea that, okay, they want to have a god born. They need someone powerful. She's not going to use herself. She needs a kid. Well, okay, she has this business set up with this guy that's a doctor that's helping her out. Why not just go to this guy that she already has under her wing and can influence and say, let's make a kid. And of course him, yeah, him not giving a shit works in her favor. So I kind of always felt like it was Kaufman, but obviously that's just a theory. I don't yeah. have any like- I, I like, I like that game theory. theory. Oh no. Um, yeah. You know, that that kind of lines up with Origins, you know, showing him as being this really sleazy pervert was yeah part of my reason is yeah i can totally um you cut off work i said he's a sleazy scumbag and i can totally see that oh, okay <laughs> okay i, I was uh, it seemed to cut off at the moment okay so this I uh, like so uh, uh as i mentioned alessa alessa was still alive and she was kept in the hospital they needed to hide her because her daughter was supposed to be dead that was her cover story there was a boiler that exploded which burned down dahlia's house and other six houses in the in the business district and alessa died so she, they couldn't have her being seen by anybody else so she was hidden in the basement hospital basement which is why no one was allowed to go down there and Kaufman had the perfect person to nurse her, someone he had under his thumb, which was uh, Lisa Garland, the very nice nurse, very pretty, very tragic. So this ties in again with the drugs. So I mentioned earlier that Kaufman was the drug dealer for White Claudia. Sorry, Editor Whitney here again. I need to make a minor correction. I keep saying White Claudia, but I mean to say PTV. That's the actual street name for the drug. Its key component is White Claudia, though, but whenever I say White Claudia, please think PTV. You see in a book in Nowhere that White Claudia has a, a number of different effects. You can see hallucinations and other weird stuff. It was a drug that the cult use a lot in their rituals which i think is another connection to who's actually making the white claudia as a drug form is probably the cult because it's something that's used in rituals and their rituals or whatever lisa was addicted to white claudia she was one of the people who couldn't go without it for a while because coffin was probably the only dealer he probably threatened to cut off her drug supply it's like hey take care of this uh person in the basement or I will not sell you drugs anymore. I won't provide you drugs anymore. And since so she was an addict, addict, she needed her fix. She did it for like seven years. But if you got to her diary, which I didn't realize was a thing until years later after she dies, <laughs> I didn't realize that there was a diary you could read. You could see in her writing that it was getting too much for her because she was seeing things that didn't make sense. She changed the bandages, but her wound the Alessa's wounds would never heal uh things it was just creeping her out she wanted to quit she attempted to quit 
didn't last more than a day, had to go back because she needed the drug. Now, I want to know what your thoughts on Lisa is. I personally believe the Lisa Harry meets in the hospital is just another manifestation of Alessa's, which is why we see her bleed out shortly after Alessa's powers are bound again by her mother. Even though it's never confirmed one way or the other, I'm under the belief that Kaufman killed her to keep her quiet on the whole secret kid in the basement operation and the drugs since she was threatening to quit again, which I think was what we saw in the opening where, he, where she's walking away and he grabs her arm and she's like, get off me, that scene. And I think he killed her for that. Um, and Alyssa, knowing that he probably murdered her friend, she's f uh, free of the of the binding spell. She has these people trapped in her nightmare world, manifested a Lisa monster to help take revenge for both of them. That, that's my own theory. Yeah, I've, I've always gotten the sense that the Lisa that we see isn't a real person. That and, and I guess this is a little influenced by the sequels, but that she's like, you know, Maria, she's like uh, Harry and Shattered Memories, that she's this ghost of a memory that that she doesn't really know why she's there she doesn't really remember everything and that she's just this kind of hollow shell that just knows it's very sad i was recently watching a, a let's play where um when you go through the hospital and you get to the basement and you see where she was kept and then you get the key that lets you go see lisa and it just seemed very interesting to me that if you think about it, there's no reason Dahlia would know about Lisa or in any way care if or want Harry to meet Lisa. It's it felt very pointed that he sees where Alessa was and then is guided to where Lisa is. I mm -hmm. think if Lisa, whether she's a ghost or a memory, I think Alessa wanted someone to see her and know what happened to her and mourn her. Yeah, you know, like pointedly bringing Harry to see Lisa. I also thought that maybe it was a Alessa's way to help Harry. Like, I don't think she wanted him mm -hmm. there when she completed her spell. She wanted, um, I don't know, her to help him get out of town also. Well, um, it also, she very well could be just kind of before Harry even arrives in the town. It's very possible that she would have dreamed up someone to be a kind figure to her. Because she's locked in a basement with absolutely no one on the whole planet caring about her. Being dealt with probably by many nurses. Um, because she was not the only room down there either. It was a weird way to get to it, but there's several patient rooms there. Numbered, labeled, with equipment in them. So we can assume that she probably wasn't the only patient and that they probably had some cover story for why these patients were handled in this way or in this area. Oh, that's and they good. probably only let certain nurses or staff go back, back there, but that she would come up with someone, just anything at that point so that she could feel kindness. I, I, I think that Lisa was probably the only form of kindness she ever got in her life. Because it's clear that her mother abused her. Uh, the kids at school. Um, this this kind of goes back to her manifestations. Uh, it it it's kind of hinted at that all the monsters we're seeing are from her own nightmares. The kids in the school with the knives are probably kids that were bullying her, scratching in her desk. You know, thief, go home, die. You know that shit. Uh, the dogs, skin dogs pterodactyls which apparently are from according to the guide her favorite book the lost world by uh, sir arthur conan doyle and apparently the pterodactyls and those uh scared her a bunch so that's why they're in her nightmares so a lot of the creatures we do encounter are things from either her life or things she feared and i thought that nowhere was really interesting because this is this is when we get to nowhere, it's when the pieces start falling into place. We're, we're, we're finally realizing what the deal with the town is. And it's in this area that we see a lot of areas we never encounter. We we see Alessa, Alessa praying uh, in, it looks like a home. You know, the, we saw the other church uh, altar and whatnot. But this one, when you get off the elevator, 
there's wood on the floor. So it looks like it's a house of some sort. Another room, you see it might be either under under a stairs or maybe just a top room in a house uh, where Alessa's like crouched and she's crying and there's all this graffiti on the walls. That might be somewhere else in the Gillespie home. We're seeing these little peeks into her life and how unhappy she was. Um, and the fact that you're following a little upper, um, little ghost Alyssa around everywhere, uh, kind of putting these pieces together. They, there's a moment in the game when you go to the town center and you're just about to go up the escalator and the TVs come to life. And you see, you see Cheryl calling out for her father, where are you? And then you see flashes of the 14 year old Alessa, the photo that we find in the hospital room, which kind of confuses me because she looks too old to be seven years old, but it's Alessa. And then we see these weird symbols. Uh, they're, they're symbols for the Olympic spirits. And they, uh, I did a little, did a little research for it for my, for my let's play, but these spirits also kind of lorded over different planets. Uh, I think, uh, what was the, I forgot the key name, but one of them was a ruler over Saturn. And in Lost Memories book, uh, there was a quote from, I think, was it Sato? I think it was Sato. He said that then when, when they were designing Nowhere, the doors with the, the, the Olympian uh, spirits on there that we see, like Betharchy, uh, all those ones, it's supposed to represent uh, entering a, a locked part of Alyssa's mind. We are in Alyssa's mind at that point. And what we're seeing are her memories and her frustrations, but it just takes the form of the hospital because that's where she spent most of her life at that point, I mean, seven years in the basement. And I always thought that was really interesting. And that's also where Lisa <laughs> kind of crumbles. You wake up and she's already twitching and stuff because at that point her powers are bound and she's lost control of her manifestations. So I, I thought the game was kind of, it is kind of clear when you think about it that, that the monsters we are seeing are not just there to be scary, but they do have oh, a tie mm -hmm. to Alyssa. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, they're, they all have like a specific thing that you can find in the world that explains. Like, oh, I, I just had another thought. Like the, the um, twin feeler, yeah, the twin feeler moth. Is that the name? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then you see Alessa's bedroom and you see all the pinned moths on the on the wall. You know, there's that. The the lizard we fought in, in the Midwitch, Harry comments that this was from a fairy tale that he read long ago. And we read it in the in the game for a hint on how to beat it. So a lot of things are conjured directly from Alessa's mind. It's like, hey, we are in this girl's nightmare world. So I, I just thought this was cool. Uh, that's why yeah. I thought it was clear that Lisa that we met was not a real person, given how she died and then came back to drag Kaufman to his doom. <laughs> if you got I don't the know that I ever thought that Lisa was specifically a projection of Alessa. Um, I think it's it's a, it's definitely a possibility. I always just took that as I think what what some of the other people here were, were talking about was she was either like a, a memory or or sort of a ghost that had kind of been bound there. I think an alternate theory to the um, the sort of the basement patient room area could have been that even though there was equipment and everything down there, that could have been like the old section where they're really not using it anymore. Mm -hmm. She was the only patient there because all the secrecy, if there were other patients there, I think that would have been maybe a little harder to cover up. And there probably would have been only one nurse assigned to that. And that was the one with the drug problem that they could control. Yep. And like you were saying, Lisa probably was the only kind person that, that Alessa had contact with. So maybe it was like lots of other things um, in the first game and other games too. Lisa's presence kind of became a stain, almost like, you know, how a ghost haunts a house. And whether it's specifically Alessa kind of projecting her into that setting mm -hmm. or if she was just sort of there because of, you know, because oh, like an echo, you, like an echo. Yeah, like a yeah. Ghost. Okay. You remove Alessa from um, the town, and there's still something weird going on. Like, and not just with the drugs, but just sort of the, 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 the spirits. And there's, there's still something. If you take Alessa out of the equation, that that could have. Uh, I, I think. To I think that. why I'm stuck on that she's a manifestation is because of the line she gives. Lisa, what's the matter with you? I get it now. 
why I'm still alive even though everyone else is dead. I'm not the only one who's still walking around. I'm the same as them. I just hadn't noticed it before. The only them you see in that area are the other uh, demonic nurses. That's why I'm like, oh, she is just like them, just with a kind facade. And at that point, that facade was starting to break because Alyssa right. had no more control because her powers were bound again. That's so, also a vague line, too, and I, I would argue that it's open to interpretation. But oh, yes, I, of course. I, like of course. a lot of the other things in the game, I think that's great that, again, you're, you're, not giving a specific, you're not given a specific answer, so you can... You can formulate all kinds of theories. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's that's part of the reason why I think the game sticks. Well, at least it stuck with me is because there are so many things unanswered. And you could go back and replay and have a, a completely new theory. You know, I, I mean, I used to think Elisa was a real person and then she just died for some reason. <laughs> Yeah, it's probably like, <laughs> one of the reasons we're still talking about the game and its story 20 years later is because there yeah. is still so much open. I and, wanted that yeah. ambulance ending to be real. Save Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely think that not just this game, but the series as a whole, that's why it endures is that, you know, I joke about shit like the circumcision guy, but, you know, everyone has theories, some of them ridiculous, some of them sound. That it, any sort of discussion will keep something alive no matter oh, yes. what happens to the original thing. I mean, we're still talking about this game, and it's been 20 years since it released. I mean, We're that's talking about something. this game, and it's been two hours. Uh, <laughs> yes, it has, yes. Um, so, I mean, was there anything that you guys wanted to add about Lisa? I, mean, I talked a whole bunch, so I'm really sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I had lots of feelings. <laughs> She's my favorite character in the game, and I think it is because Harry is obviously out there and looking for his kid. Have you seen a little girl anywhere? I'm looking for my daughter. She's only seven, short, black hair. She's missing. I'm sorry. But Lisa somehow manages to be the only character in the game who seems like they care. Like, Harry seems like he's in a wild panic, and everyone else seems like they are on some serious drugs or serious sociopaths. And Lisa's the only character that you come across that it's like, wow, here is a person with their empathy chip installed correctly. Are you, wait, wait. You're, you're thinking that Harry wasn't uh, empathetic enough about his daughter and her plight? Oh, it's not that he's not empathetic. It's that he's so busy worrying about trying to find her mm -hmm. and having had my kid hide before on purpose to try and scare me it works really well and you just kind of go into this all of your emotions turn off because it suddenly becomes i have to find them and i have to find them now everything else stops so it's like he's stuck kind of in this well he didn't he didn't seem to care about alessa and, and the whole plight with dahlia he was just more concerned about find, finding his kid and getting out there so i agree with you there um I always gave him props for not, like, he's just like, oh, I'm running into an alley. Things are starting to get really bloody and there's a dead body. What the fuck? Well, I, I gotta find Cheryl now. She's out here somewhere. I don't want her to die. I always gave him props for, like, not yeah, getting Yeah, no, up. you can do some, I have learned as a parent, you can do some really stupid, stupid things without even thinking about them because you're like, nope. That is my kid. That is between me and my kid. I don't care that it is a large dog. I don't care that it <laughs> lift, is trying to bite me. Lift a collar off your kid. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. it's that kind of thing. Like, just all of a sudden your brain just goes, well, that's the trump card. It takes over everything else. What I, um, talking about Harry, what uh, Team Silent, uh, at least Sato, he, he mentioned in, an, I forget where, was it? I think it was an online interview, and I'm sorry, I can't think of where it was. All the, they're all like kind of mushed in my head. He said at one point that they wanted to keep Harry kind of a neutral character because he, I thought he definitely feels like a player avatar. Yeah, because uh, they wanted uh, if he was neutral, the scares and stuff you could in, imprint your own yourself there, and 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 fears and whatnot it's supposed to he, they didn't want to take away from the atmosphere so if he was just yeah. you know humdrum you know 
I always thought that was kind of interesting because uh, I think they tried to do that with Henry too, but he kind of just came off. He ends up coming off like he's not a real person, which we'll get into my theories when we get to the room. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I yes. kind of felt with Harry in some ways and with Henry especially, um, and maybe this just comes from my own personal experience, but I always felt like they were dissociating. and that, I could definitely see that. I mean, if you're seeing you know, some when, fucked up shit. Being a person that has been in that kind of anxious situation, not this kind, but you, you get what mm, I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> where you, you, your body reaches the point where it cannot process anymore and you just go, okay, well, you know, you know, that's always kind of how I, I interpreted Harry in this game. And, and some of the other characters, James a bit, I think, does this too, where it's just like they're acting off because they are not there. They can't even process how horrible this is right now. I gotta say, I, I know I, I said we weren't really going to talk about the other games, but it was such a breath of fresh air for, like, Heather and Murphy. Their reactions to what they were seeing, it was like my reactions. I, I, I clearly remember I was playing through Downpour, and there's the part where the weeping bat, is that the name of the creature? Weeping bat? Jumps weeping down bat, yeah. right, right in front of you, and I went, fuck! And he goes, fuck! I you're like, oh, I, finally. I was like, I love, oh, Murphy, I, I, <laughs> you did what I, what I, I just did. <laughs> I love that first uh, other world transition where he's like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, he, he's like really clearly just losing his mind with fear. Oh, oh shit. Fire. Anyone hear me? Fire. I felt that way about Alex, where um, that was, you know, one of the first realistic uh, expressions of fear that he's actually reacting to stuff mm -hmm. the way you would think. But for for me, Harry, it's something Michael Gwynn said in his interview was really interesting. He said um, him personally, uh, when he he doesn't like staying in a fearful place, so he usually responds to fear with like anger or energy. And for me. Um, why Harry might not be reacting why you know the way we might think someone would be in that situation is because he's just sort of like he's laser focused on his daughter so he can't let that in oh like what um a destiny no, was talking about he was just uh, had blinders on he, he's like I'm on a right. mission I, I just need to get to my little girl I don't okay there's a weird dog chasing me I don't I don't give a fuck we're just gonna keep going oh I found a gun I, yeah, oh, and like, then he like he can't even only... entertain the notion of of something like that because he knows it'll just wipe him out. So he does. He just has to keep moving forward. Yeah, and that's like everyone else. Like there's Harry, who's got that laser focus kind of thing going on, and then there's Lisa, who's actually kind and interacts with other people and checks in even on just Harry. And then there's literally every other character in this game, and you're just <laughs> like, oh. Okay, literally no one here has empathy. Oh, uh, hey, hey, sort. hey, Sybil gave Harry her gun because he's like, okay, mm -hmm. I can't stop you from going out there by yourself, but at least you have protection. I can't just leave her out there by herself. Have you got a gun? Um, no. Take this and hope you don't have to use it. Now listen to me. Before you pull the trigger, know who you're shooting. And don't do it unless you have to. And don't go blasting me by mistake. Got it? That's she, another... And then she hightailed it. Well, she's trying to that's she's another... trying to get a backup, but that didn't work out, did it? What what that's, for? That's another great line delivery of uh she asked him if he has a gun. He's like um, no. Uh, no. <laughs> Whitney, I had a question for you about, um, hmm. Lisa that just popped in there. Okay. Um, what was up with the weird look she gives 
she's like looking at Harry when he wakes up that one time. Oh, 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 and nowhere. That so is that her starting to break down? That's her, that's that's Alyssa. Her that was directly after the Flores bound Alyssa's powers again, and as soon as you wake up, uh, he, he Harry has a shock face. You see Lisa behind him also coming up. And she stands up, and then her eye and her she just starts twitching. And so she's got this weird like tick on her, her mouth, her eye. Because it's necromancy. Because <laughs> I'm like at that point, uh, throw her gyro. Losing control. I I you could attribute to maybe uh, the thing that got me was she died after she confronted her memories about what she did in the past and whatnot, and then she just started bleeding. So I was like, okay, she got her memories back. Maybe that twitch was drug related. She started getting the um, the shakes and whatnot. She needed the white Claudia. But I always keep going back to, well, Alyssa doesn't have her power. She's not powerful anymore. Maybe she's just in her grip. And that's why Lisa's starting to lose it as well. And that little oh, twitch like a- is, a, is like an indication that there's something not right with Lisa right now. Um, I don't know if they're I just mean, trying to be creepy or what. I've always what thought that you have real Alessa at first, or not Alessa, real Lisa at first when you first meet her. But by the time you encounter her again, she's dead. Like, real dead. The interesting thing, though, is, again, I go back to why I don't think she's human at all. She was never human in the first place. was because we only meet Lisa... In the alternate hospital, we never mm. see her in the foggy world where we see other humans. So I thought that was really interesting because those nurses that we encounter, they're only in the alternate version of the hospital. We don't see them out in the streets like the dogs and uh, the pterodactyls. So that was like another thing in my mind was like, okay, that's a little odd compared to the other human characters. We seem to meet them in other places. I know she was the character was afraid to leave, but why didn't she? I don't know. Why didn't we see her in the foggy hospital when, uh, when Harry woke up again? Every time he met her, it's like he was he he was having a headache. He fell to the ground and then he found himself there, or he was traveling through the alternate world to get back to the hospital. It was I always thought that was odd compared mm-hmm. to the other other people. Because you've mentioned it, I also want to say I've always found it super interesting that only two people ever respond it with physical pain to the other world transformation, and that's Harry and Heather. Mm-hmm. They're the only ones that do it. Everybody else, it doesn't seem to affect them. And and for Heather, I guess it's supposed to be that she she has the god. Yeah. For Harry, I, I think maybe that ties into your theory that Lisa is not real or is something because maybe he is passing into the world in a more real sense and it's hurting him because he's entering this this other realm. Yeah, like you know, maybe let's see. It that is I never really thought about that point where like Harry and Heather are the only ones that are are pain when they when they transition. The only other time I can think in the game where he doesn't like well actually two uh was in the alley he didn't uh while it was transitioning he was okay it wasn't until afterwards where the the kids stabbed him did he wake up and it was like all a dream or whatever but uh speaking back to the drug side mission when you get past that uh point on the road the world starts to to transform right under his feet he seems okay at that point so yeah, he's like a little unstable, but he, he doesn't seem like he's actually in pain. But it seems whenever it is, he is with Lisa, Hurts. he has he has the headaches and stuff. So that's a good, uh, interesting correlation. Like, I'm wondering if that's Alessa maybe affecting his mind so he sees this woman or what? Oh, I guess that's something to think about. I don't think ever, anybody's ever brought that up before. Yeah, I've never heard that before. That's cool. But yeah, Lisa... We don't meet a lot. We don't see her a lot, but I gotta say, she probably had the biggest impact on me when I played it. Like I always thought about her, even in the other games, and she kind of became like one of my favorite characters. She was just so tragic. And I, I know I said we weren't going to talk about the other games, but I did want to touch on on the origins stuff. People were very upset that Lisa seemed. Uh, she was very flirtatious and coy and touching Travis and 
having sex with Kaufman. I was I always got the impression that the reason why she wasn't like that in San Hill One is because it wasn't the real woman. Like Alessa didn't know the real Lisa. She saw the best side of her when she was caring for her and you, you know what I mean? So I, I, like I feel memory, Jerry. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, I feel like the same people were really, really angry at shattered memories, Lisa. I I don't get the idea that she wasn't fl- like in the first game she throws herself at Harry and then kind of leans away and has this smile on her face. I always felt like she was flirting with him in the first game. Like that was not new to me when I played Origins. I felt like that was her that she was really, you know, because she didn't know who she was and had no memories, in a way she was kind of looking to Harry to be her knight in shining mm-hmm. armor and to try and make him save her, she sort of was like flirting with him. And then you see the flirting and the sort of that behavior fade away as she becomes more monstrous. Yeah. uh, What I, uh, mm, I'm trying to understand why people were upset. It seemed like a lot of people, when they played Silent Hill 1, in their mind, Lisa was just this innocent person. Like she had no trouble. She she was just stuck up in there. Yeah. And and Angel. They're upset to find out that she was flawed. It was drugs. They were like, no, she never did drugs. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Everyone did drugs. She did drugs. It was very obvious to me in Silent Hill that... She said it in her diary. Need drug. Need drug. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, we were talking, you know, like 30 minutes ago, but we were talking about, you know, what we thought of Lisa as a character, and I'd agree with Destiny. I think she's absolutely my favorite character in the game because of those flaws that everyone else kind of fits into either like Harry's this very neutral, very um, player avatar kind of feeling character and all the cult people end up kind of, I don't want to say the cartoony isn't the right word, but they're all just, they're villains. They're over, they're over the top. They're just, yeah, they're video game villains. Yeah. Yeah. They're about, all out making puppy coats. Wait, well, yeah. okay. What about Sybil? I mean, I th- always thought Sybil was very kind. She no, si- no, Sybil's great. Um, And Sybil, I, I like the Sybil's idea. Sybil's a cameo. Being, yeah. She's not in the game a whole lot, and we have no information on her, at least not that I remember. Well, oh, um, I guess I could touch on that a little bit. Um, the reason why she was even there in the first place is because we, we see a brief uh, flash of this in the opening, but she was on the phone. She was on the phone with someone in Silent Hill, and communication suddenly cut. This was something, I mean, I don't, the play novel kind of goes into what Sybil saw, but that game, oh my goodness, uh, it's... I don't think it's canon, but I do believe she was brought there because the phones were cut out and she was like, what the heck's going on? So she went to go investigate. Um, And then she got caught up in all the shit and decided to help out Harry, which I thought was really cool. You know, like she couldn't leave anyway, but I I always thought her, you know what? I'll check out the Lakeside Music Park. Let's find your daughter. I thought it was very brave and kind of her. So I liked her as well, but I agree with you guys. Lisa's more tragic and... I don't know, connected with her more. She's very surreal. She is, you know, everybody else kind of makes sense. The the cop that came and got lost, the lady that lived there, and, you know, but but Lisa comes out of nowhere and feels very mysterious. Mm-hmm. I, I think another part of it is that, you know, the cult, they have plans. They There's things that they're doing. Harry has a goal. He's trying to find her daughter. Sybil's very heroic, and she's just trying to be a good cop. Lisa's nobody. She's just a person trying to get by caught in the middle of all these horrible things and her life was stolen from her by the drugs by Kaufman by the cult she never did anything wrong she just she I mean she did drugs and shit obviously but she got addicted to that Mm -hmm. these things were done to her and then eventually there's nothing left but her sorrow yeah Uh, I do want to I do want to circle back to Kaufman uh, for another a little bit I I was wondering what you guys thought. I always got the impression that Kaufman really didn't understand what the cult was trying to do. He just thought it was a money-making thing and he was doing drugs. That's why he was so, so mad <laughs> at Talia mm-hmm. and this shit storm that was going on. He's just like, this is not what I wanted. Turn things back right now. And he has this good. Quit screwing around. 
return things to how they were before. Kaufman! Did I ask for this? Nobody uses me. You won't get away with this. Your work is over. We don't need you anymore. What do you think you can accomplish by coming here? Maybe he didn't think that it would actually work. Maybe. Or just he, thought they were a bunch of coked out lunatics. Yes. That too. <laughs> he seemed very surprised. So I never, I, I always thought that he wasn't really a part of the cults. He just had a partnership. Like he was doing his own thing and he helped them out. He helped out Dahlia. But he wasn't actually part of the cult. And the weird thing with Origins is they kind of made Kaufman part of the cult which I didn't really agree with. So I was wondering if you guys thought he was part of the cult or... He's like there at the final boss fight. Yes, he? yeah, he's there. Uh, I always felt that he didn't have the whole story and he, like Harry, was double-crossed by Dahlia, obviously, which is why he shot her. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, he always came off to me like he was, he was just a money man. He was just some regular corrupt asshole. Mm -hmm. And got wrapped up in something that he didn't understand or care about. And then when all of that crazy shit, they were always mumbling to him while they picked up their little baggies of drugs came true. He was completely unprepared for it. I mean, the first thing we see of him is him sitting in a chair, looking about to piss himself. I don't think he was prepared for any of that. He, did, he just shot a pterodactyl thing, an air screamer in yeah. his office. Yeah. I think he was, I, I, I don't think that he was ready for the sorts of shit he was seeing. Yeah, he, he was very upset about the monsters and the weather. Everyone seems to have disappeared. And it's snowing out this time of year. Something's gone seriously wrong. Did you see those monsters? Have you ever seen such aberrations? Ever even heard of such things? You and I both know creatures like that don't exist. Yeah. And where'd all the people go? God damn it, it's snowing. It's only July. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Maine. And I, I guess I want to uh, go back to the whole relationship with Lisa. So the first game kind of made it seem it was just like he was providing drugs and he got her to take care of Alessa. Were you guys upset of the whole sexual uh, turn it took in Origins? Or are you like me? I felt that that was kind of a given. If he ah. was blackmailing her for care with Alyssa, I, Alyssa, I would assume he was also getting sex out of her too, but it might have sure. just been me. It, it feels like I mean, I think that, that story. Yeah, I, I feel like that's, that's kind of how I always imagined it. Like you have a, a woman in your power that is vulnerable to you and you're a man in power who we see likes to be in control. Like, why wouldn't he? He's an awful person. Yeah, I wouldn't have necessarily thought that of Lisa, but I certainly thought it of Kaufman. Mm -hmm. And I think any woman probably upon playing that game felt that way. Like even if they're younger teenage girls, it's kind of that he has that immediate yes. quality that makes you go, ugh. That, that, that's what immediately, that <laughs> immediately popped in my head. I, I, I said this, I, I was in high school when I played and I went, oh no. I was yeah. really expecting that to be revealed as well. Frankly, it went a lot better than I expected it mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. My immediate thought would look at like you get that that sense like, oh no, mm -mm. not that, not that guy. I do not trust him. So I, I, I guess I, I guess I was taken aback. I guess when Origins really kind of explored that more and how upset a lot of people were about it, because I. That was one of my first thoughts. I'm like, oh, they do not have a healthy relationship. She's well, a druggie. I mean, not all Kaufmans. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I think that is the root of the problem. Is at least for in my experience, I think a lot of male fans weren't fans of it because to them, Lisa, they they a lot of people I think idolize Lisa. I hate to use this word, but like the waifu, you know, they, they have this idea of <laughs> oh, female absolutely. character. And they, they like her, they idolize her. And the idea that this Kaufman guy is getting with her and whatever, and like, they don't like it because he's with her. And not even the aspect of it's an abusive, horrible relationship. 
you know, that's being, you know, explored in this story. Just that's the idea that another, who... yes, just the idea that another man could get with her. It, it, it the, the sorts of things I've always seen, like on the Silent Hill subreddit and places, is that people besides, seem to think it's like, Besides oh. uh, Silent Hills is coming back through uh, Death Stranding. Yeah, aside from never be game over, um, is a lot of that like, oh, you know, that that they think it's somehow making her impure, which is really creepy to say that that she's like, oh, so she was a slut. I don't like that. It's like, I don't. The thing that I think it's saying is that she was on drugs and addicted to drugs and Coffin's a horrible, evil person who when she came to him and said that she needs the drugs and she's going really badly into the withdrawals, but she didn't have any money, Kaufman took advantage of that. He's like, oh, you could pay in other ways, baby. Which yeah. is not uncommon check. in real life. Yep. That's what I said. Or confused feels, about. Like, I'm, I'm, like I'm, always, I'm always taken off by like the fact that People get all mad about this and whatever, but and I just double checked this. Kaufman is forty three, and in Origins, she was sixteen. Yep. <laughs> like this is clearly a manipulative, abusive relationship. But oh, she's a slut. Well, that's yeah, it's gross. Very often the direction that it goes, and it's like it's not that she's a slut; it's that he's like the used car salesman of cocaine, guys. <laughs> Yeah, and it's obvious. Oh, I love like, that. From the first second you see him in the first game, it's like this is a terrible person and uh, probably uh, responsible for half the shit going on here. Because I mean, if they redid it for today, it would be more like it was in Shattered Memories. He's just out there handing out fucking oxy like it is mm-hmm. Tic Tacs, and yeah, of course he would take advantage of somebody it kind of requires you to take advantage of people to begin with to be a massive drug seller. Also, he, uh, you know, doctors are supposed to do no harm. He is not a very good doctor. Oh. <laughs> well, I feel like I that mean, We can add that to the list for sure. <laughs> um, I think a different reason why some fans um, might have an issue with it, and this is kind of separate from the story, um, backstory kind of part of it, is that it was a just a different team that was working on it so whether or not you know they felt a certain way with the old lisa versus the new lisa i think there was a a pushback it with of, it's not canon it's yeah. not the same team it's not canon it's just it's not the same point of view mm-hmm. um and if i'm being perfectly honest i've always kind of um i didn't have an issue with uh origins but it was for me it was almost like a a what if i don't know if you guys remember but uh marvel comics did kind of like a what if series like yeah, what if the punisher, punisher got you know venom's symbiote yeah. suit, that kind yeah, of yeah. stuff what if electra yeah. hadn't died oh, there's one they do kind of all feel- <laughs> i'm just joking it's the one thing anybody knows about her i'm just joking Peter never gotten bit by a spider mm-hmm. in like a two-page issue yeah but, i can seven yeah, see it is that, that way four from- movies didn't suck <laughs> um, I guess what I'm saying for that is um, I've always kind of divorced myself from sort of the origin storyline, and it was more like it's it's kind of retcon the game. It's not a bad retcon. It's just th- the information we're given in one is great because it's vague enough to where you could draw those conclusions, whereas Origins is like, no, this is actually – I think it's just more up front, and I think whether or not um, – people's ideas of lisa being pure versus a slut or anything like that i think it's just it's maybe too specific like it mm-hmm. gives you a little, a little too much of a a picture for that whereas the vaguer picture is more interesting or I, the creator I, I, wanting to connect things but i, I think I, at the same the same point they're i don't know i think they gave me a little too much and again too I many answers to the the vague questions that you may have had too on the nose you know but um, again, I didn't have a problem with it. I thought it was interesting. I just, and uh, I wrote a little bit about it, my uh, retrospective about the whole Eastern point of view, where for me, Silent Hill 1 and Origins, it, that's the perfect example of that, where the Eastern point of view is more abstract. It leaves more to your imagination. And if we're getting, you know, microscopic with the Lisa and Kaufman relationship, vague, you have a cut scene, you have notes, everything's kind of third hand, even from Lisa herself, because you know, if we're, if we're going with the Alessa theory or Lisa's a ghost or whatever, you never even meet the real Lisa. So there's that. And then you have Origins, which was a Western team, and they're like, their interpretation is more more direct. And 
for me, it's, you know, a little less in interesting. But again, a what if scenario is like, oh, OK, I guess, you know, Kaufman was way more direct and she was way more vulnerable or, or, or open sexually. Um, but it never really bothered me because I never took it that seriously, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm kind of the, the the same way. I also, I guess, I take into mind her age in that in that story as well. Uh, again, I didn't mean to bring up origins so much, but I remember I was very excited because I thought it was going to go more about the cult and the actual ritual and all that shit. And it just seemed like Lisa and Kaufman and Dahlia were just thrown in. I know that. It was it was mainly Travis's little story, him dealing with his issues, but it, it's just like, why did it have to be before Silent Hill? Why couldn't it have just been after? Not to be that person, but it's kind of like a specific game where they decided to trot out Pyramid Head for no reason. Uh, yes, well, Homecoming. I, I definitely think, and you know, we'll talk about Homecoming when we get to it, but I definitely think that that was part of that point in silent hills development history that the movie came out and was mm -hmm. i don't know how it did financially but it certainly was one of those things where it was like oh my god this video game movie isn't complete shit yeah. um and then yeah. i think that with origins and obviously homecoming i mean homecoming uses the pyramid head design it uses the church design i mean that, that oh they like, deny it though for some weird reason but it's, it's like almost <laughs> it's one like they one. went the stories on both of those are actually okay and i when we get around to talking about it, I actually really love Homecoming. Yeah, yeah I, other than its technical complete failure. I like aspects. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just it leave it at that. Uh, I like but aspects of that game. <laughs> but it's very obvious after Silent Hill 4, really. Anything after that was very much informed by people going and like digging through the assets of the prior games. I don't even mean playing it. Yeah. They just looked at the assets and went, hey, what looks cool that we haven't used recently? I think a lot of that's also corporate stuff coming down from whoever yeah. was making the big decisions. If you listen to Tommy Hewlett mm -hmm. and all the bad ideas we didn't get, like, it could have been a lot The worse. psychic battle. could have been so much worse. Above to the yeah, Lake? I, yes. Yeah. There's no... Well, I, I feel like... Poor I Tom. feel like they were always going to be damned because, one, they were taking it from the original people who made the game, and they were taking it from the original culture, and then now Konami knows they have a brand, a name. Well, how do we... It, it's no longer about making a game that will sell. It's about making a brand that will sell. So what's yeah. the brand? It's yeah, Pyramid it's Head. It's this. It's that. And so immediately these oh, teams yes. who are doing their best are just screwed from the get-go because of the situation and it sucks that even today i still hear every damn day about how horrible bullshit and it's just like the circumstances were completely against them and people, the people don't not... know how this works like you have a boss your boss tells you you have to do something did you know that they originally wanted to remake silent hill but then the I'm konami really upper uh, executives were like no that's gonna be too much money. Just so, uh, yeah. just just rework it into this wee idea you guys had with the with the snow. Put Silent Hill yeah. One stuff in there because this people people like Silent Hill One. I like the idea of that literally being what the executives say. No, we'll make a snow <laughs> game. Hey, I want you to make a game for the Vita. Oh mm. no no no! It has to be isometric, and I want it to be like Diablo. Yeah. Have fun. And I want it, and I want it to have all like the the all these seemingly random bottomless well of non really connected bullshit with its story. There was um, that thing that came out recently. I, I something I think maybe was on your website, Whitney, about uh, Sam Barlow talking about how it was Konami's idea to put Pyramid Head in Origins. Oh, oh, it was it was that Reddit post I I saw it. I, I shared it on Twitter. So there's another guy uh, who, who sent a lot of um, videos and talking about the making of Origins. Like, he, I, I don't, I guess he had a connection because he has this like prototype footage and whatnot. He said that that wasn't in any of the scripts he read, but the guy claimed he talked to Sam Barlow somewhere, I guess some convention where he was at. And Sam Barlow was like, you know, at first they were going to have Pyramid in in there and he was going to be this 
chef who said stuff about chopping people up and squishing their eyeballs, and that was going to be the origins of Pyramid Head. But then we didn't like that, and we kind of convinced them to give it to us. This is when it was uh, Climax LA, where they were going for the Scrubs comedy, dark comedy aspect that was mentioned briefly in Edge magazine in, in that one interview. So what you're telling me is they were making a real effort to tank this, and then they finally just had to get around to canceling it because people wouldn't accept that they wanted to fuck it up. That was the version. That was the one version. That I was like, I, I, I don't know about this, guys. We, we, we say that, like, oh, they're terrible now, but, oh, man, it could have been so much worse. And I mean, what you're telling me really sounds like they didn't want to have to cancel it. So what they were going to do was just... That we boyfriend at- thing where they're like, guys, what if we just make them so miserable they leave? Don't they like in, in Japanese culture, they don't like to fire people. They like to encourage them to quit. Yes. So maybe that's That's what they did to their fans. <laughs> they were <laughs> trying to just encourage us to quit. <laughs> no, the- we got Pachinko. Oh, I'd still, Related, I'd still but- like to try it, but... I, I will say this is completely off subject, but since we're talking about pachinko and we won't do an episode on pachinko, I assume. No. Um, one of my one of the things that I actually really love that, that came out of all that shit with Konami and the cancellation of Silent Hills is uh, my absolute favorite piece of music from any of the games is the lyrical version of Love Song from Book of Memories. I find it a I find it a beautiful song. I love how it sounds like it's is this beautiful note to leave the series on. It seems like it's saying, you know, we've had rough patches, some of these games you haven't loved, but would you have rather not have any of them? Would you have rather tear out the pages of our memories? Mm-hmm. I think it's a wonderful note to close out the series on. Even if you don't like Book of Memories, that's where it ends. The Pachinko Machine has a new <laughs> song just called The End, where the <laughs> lyrics sound like a suicide note. I feel I'm dying from the pain. Won't you suffer my disease? It's so hard to hold on to you. Would you help me end it if I asked you to? I mean, it's it, it it's this incredibly depressing, angry ass sounding song, and all of the lyrics are like are literally saying like, "Goodbye, I'm dead." <laughs> oh boy! I had um, pushed to talk, so you couldn't hear me laughing, but I promise <laughs> you, I nearly died. You could go ahead. You can go ahead and laugh. <laughs> so I, know, I, I wrote a whole piece on that when I found out about it. It actually isn't a bad song either, but it's. It fits that mood, though, because it's for the Pachinko Machine, so it's like this weird techno rock song. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you know, not to, <laughs> you know, obviously Akira did, you know, all those great rock songs for the other games, but it sounds so un-Silent Hill that that too fits. Hmm. It's like, yeah, no, that is <laughs> if, actually if, if, if you're song. listening right. to this and you have not seen the Pachinko videos, just go to YouTube and look it up, because, oh my god. Just All hit right. the lever. Yeah, well, I people, we're going to change from here on out. Instead of hashtag fuck Konami on our Silent Hill articles, we're just going to do Jesus Christ Konami. <laughs> <is the topic>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here's here's a here's a fun fact for any rely on horror readers listening in. If you search fuck Konami, all one word where the K is both words, it works just uh, as well you, as just typing Silent Hill. <laughs> it, it, it will come up. We have indeed tagged articles with that. Oh, lots of them. I'll, I'll have to check that out. I'm not surprised, given you know your feelings. <laughs> have y'all heard that? Uh, I I don't know when this was announced. I heard about it a couple hours ago today. That Konami's having a special announcement at <gasps> E3 on Tuesday. Yes. They are. Yes. Oh, what the fuck are they canceling this I time? They are. I cannot Two. wait. Metal Gear Survive Two is going to be so great. <laughs> PT lives. 
a new pachinko machine. Can you one remake and it's gonna be terrible. <laughs> can you imagine the 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 orgasm heard around the world hmm. if they okay, announced you know what? Show? If they resurrect Silent Hill, I am totally here for it, and I'm here for it. In- terrible I way am. i'm not here for it in the way that i'm like oh i'm a fan of the series and i've really enjoyed the games and you know i hope they come back they have fucked up so hard for me as a consumer that at this point i'm here for it just to watch people play death stranding first and then shred them alive just completely flay them over fucking <laughs> up with them i still i still have i know i talked about it during uh the halloween live stream I still have a promise to keep. There is a guy on Reddit who is extremely angry with me that I wouldn't accept the theory that Death Stranding is Silent Hills. And I promised him that if it did turn out to be Silent Hills, I would eat a shoe on camera. You would? What, would it be a chocolate shoe? No, I, I would. I have complete confidence in this. I would boil and uh, and saute or, or sauce a shoe and eat it with a fork. Okay, like a the, the thing about... This is off topic too, but the thing about the idea that Silent Hills is Death Stranding is I don't think these people understand what it is to be a creator and a writer. And when you have a project that fails or a project that maybe, oh, I liked this thing. I want to take this concept and put it over here. Like you, you repurpose and you reuse ideas and themes and concepts. And, and just because things that he was going to do in Silent Hills appear in this new game that he's actually being allowed to finish and make, that doesn't mean they are the same game. That just means he's taking ideas and, and things he couldn't finish and, and, and repurposing them. Well, especially without Konami breathing down his neck about what mm-hmm. they do and do not want in the game, we would never have gotten what Death Stranding is going to be out oh, of sure. Konami. Oh, especially, uh, especially considering that just the size they're talking about that would not have happened because they were not going to put that much money into that much development. Oh yeah, this is honestly he might have gone out. He's put a lot on the line to make this game, and if it fails, it is very likely the only game that studio will make. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's one of those things you see, like not just the way the game looks and how huge it is, but like that cast. Like, it's all A-list TV actors. Yeah, that would... I feel like Sony just wrote them a blank check. Probably. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, to me, this kind of feels like when I was looking at the promotional material before the release of Until Dawn, and I'm looking at it going, either this game's going to be fucking excellent and sell really well, or this studio is going to fold. And luckily it did well, but it's one of those things you're looking at it going, yeah, it did really well, but you look at like the cast and the size of it and what they're doing and the fact that at that time that was also kind of reinventing the wheel of what we expect from a game and you look at it and go, Jesus, this is either going to go real, real well or really poorly. That was after a couple of major redesigns to it as well. Yeah, and that was actually, that's a thing that CJ and I have been talking about. I made the joke about Metal Gear Survive earlier. I've actually been playing that recently because, you know, I hate myself. And <laughs> it's actually been really shocking to me how really obvious it is while playing that Metal Gear Survive is designed around documents or something that Kojima was forced to leave at Konami because they are weirdly similar. A lot of the same, like just from the trailers, at least for Death Stranding, a lot of the concepts with um, like carrying things going out into the wilderness, there being like an other world kind of thing where monsters are, a lot of that same sort of shit is in Metal Gear Survive. And I really feel that that was them with, that Kojima's had this idea for years and was forced to leave certain things he did as a Konami employee behind. And that's how Metal Gear Survive got made so fast. But now he's able to make the game he actually wanted to, whatever that was back at Konami. But that's just a theory. <laughs> game theory. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Um, okay, we've gone way off topic. There was one other thing I wanted to touch on before I ended this. Um, just to bring it back to, you know, Silent Hill. Uh, oh shit, you're right. This was a Silent Hill podcast. Yes. Was it? <laughs> really? Um, I thought it was the Lisa show. Mm, yeah, it might have, I might have to rename this the Lisa Garland Hour. Um, I wanted to, uh, and Lisa from PT, I guess. 
Uh, Lisa from Resident Evil Remake. No, never. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the references within the game because it's it's the only game really in the series that has so many references. Um, one amusing one being that Midwich Elementary is based off of Astoria Elementary and Kindergarten Cop. Or, you know, the streets being named after famous authors. I was wondering what everyone's favorite intentional or unintentional reference within the game was. Mine is the authors. Like, full stop. I loved that. As soon as I saw it, I was super, super happy. Okay. I love Crichton Street. Because I was the first time I played it, I was like, oh, you know, Kuntz Street, that's cute. Cr Crichton Street? Oh. Um, I think my favorite one, though, is Happy Burger. <laughs> Something about that is so stupid to me. <laughs> um, Happy Burger is Silent Hill 2 and 3. You're talking about Konami Burger. Oh, oh Konami or, Burger, that's right. Or uh, Queen Burger. You're right, you're right. Although nothing, and this is biased, but nothing will beat Resident Evil's Burger King stand-in, which is Burger Kong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I this love isn't how a video much game. they love burgers over there. <laughs> this isn't yeah. a video game. Okay, but, burgers. But the, the anime show Inuyasha uses Whack Donald's. Oh <laughs> I've seen I've seen it with I've seen an anime they just flip the M into a mm -hmm. W and they would Donald's. I'm like, oh, it's McDonald's, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, my favorite reference in the game, I don't know if this is a reference or if this is me extrapolating, but uh, uh last year I got to see the f the first alien film in uh, theaters at Alamo and it was really neat. And there was a scene that I saw and I was like, wait a minute, this feels really familiar. And it's the cat in the locker because in the movie, yeah. the cat is in the locker and they're approaching and it's shaking. And they're like, what's going on? And then it opened and the cat just runs out. But then it leads to the 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 cat goes where the monster is. The monster appears and kills somebody. So it kind of creates this. Oh, we're <gasps> safe. Oh wait, no, we're I not. I missed a reference. That is completely. Oh, uh, see, Rourke, you're it's right. Totally... I should have watched the entire Alien movie. I was oh, sitting here, I'm like, and I we're circling say back anything. seven years. I shouldn't <laughs> say anything. <laughs> I could have included it. Mad at me. I could have included it in my let's play, but I didn't. Um. You know, I think that is a definitely on purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting that you that you talk about that cat locker scene. Is when the cat jumps out of the locker. I was I remember the first time I was like, oh, it's a stupid jump scare. But when you come back to that and the locker opens and it's just gory inside, that scared me. That was that yep. was old school jump scare. I I loved it. Mm. Like, oh god! Just when you think everything's okay, the next locker opens and a body falls out. Like, oh god, <laughs> that was great because you're, you're 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 running yeah, by and then all of a sudden, bam! Here comes a body. You're like, that was one of my favorite parts. Uh, I'd say, well, my my favorite unintentional reference w w was uh, Midwich being in, in Kindergarten Cop. Uh, it was pretty clear that they didn't know what an American elementary school looked like and used what they had, which was a movie. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, not, to, not to keep bringing it back to Resident Evil, but because it connects in a weird way. Uh, Resident Evil does the same thing. Parts of the RPD building are based off of the Detroit Police Station in Robocop 3. Oh, I didn't uh, know that. All right, so the... what we know is they had Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. Yes. <laughs> well, that's that's the other thing is that um, the RPD uniforms are based off of the LA and their badge, especially the, the RPD like ID card is based off of the LAPD officers in The Terminator, the first Oh. I didn't know that. Yeah. They, right, it's like, well, they we're just identical. drafting him to be our official liaison with Japan. <laughs> yep. Hi, everyone. I can't speak a lick of Japanese, but hello. <laughs> I, I think my other... Um, it's always bizarre what they chose to reference in there. I mean, we have Gangsta's Paradise on a a bench we have portis head we have kindergarten cop all these horror movies it's just i couldn't believe well, no one's ever going to convince me that their health drinks are not actually five hour energies <laughs> which i've referred to them as before i've been like oh gotta stop by i forgot to grab that five hour energy over there there's a reference of something that i didn't know was a reference but that 
I, I guess is a reference to Japanese fans that the sheet music on the piano is actually sheet music. And it's for a song called don't trust anyone over 30. Oh, really? That's the name. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yes. Well, a Japanese uh, band called the Moon Riders. Or something. Again? What age was Pardon? Kaufman? <laughs> oh, he's yes. like 40. Yes. <laughs> he's over 30. He's, he's, he's like, he's back. like 50. I think, I think he's 50. Uh, in the really game. don't trust him. Mm hmm. I guess my reference is this uh, uh, a smaller moment. It's when um, I guess when you're I, I think it's still in when you're in nowhere, getting close to the end of the game, and there's the apparition of uh, small Alessa arguing with Dahlia, like she's on the floor and they're kind of arguing. Mm-hmm. And that that landing is the second floor of the Bates home in the original Psycho. Yep. Oh. It even has the original wallpaper as the texture for the uh, the wall. And uh, I was a huge Psycho fan before Silent Hill. I kind of got into that in high school. And then um, I'm not sure if I realized that I probably didn't, but going back, like I totally did. But the stairs coming up and they're at corner, there's like two iconic shots in, in the uh, the movie. It's when the detective gets stabbed. You yeah, see that shot. And then mother comes out of the room and stabs him on the stairs. Yeah. On when... Um, when the other the sister character is coming into the house, they they go around that same corner. But I just I love that. I'm like, uh, it's great that one of the things about Silent Hill, not just the references, but the the way it's kind of put together is it's this kind of mixture of all these different things. And you you think it would be this like just this bland generic, you know, it couldn't make up its mind what it wanted to be, but somehow it mixed everything together and came up with something brand new that felt fresh. Yes. And uh just all the references and you know, it was just a, a new a new way to interpret all these different it was it was it was interesting to see how the east reinterprets western horror like all the stuff they drew from is from the west and i always thought that was really interesting their their take on it you know what aspects they pull from our movies literature whatever it's like their interpretation i guess we're we're seeing the opposite with the uh western versions of silent hill but yeah, because well, you can't reinterpret it through to... another filter when you're using it's like the how the what the west can't reinterpret it itself that's like going back to robocop for a second that was um paul verhoven who is i can't remember what he is i think he's polish or something i'm butchering that probably but his whole satirical look at, at, at american action movies and all that like that was something only he could do mm-hmm. and just Whereas the way we're that we're trying to interpret America through the eyes of Japanese people who had not been to America. Well, we're trying to reinterpret Western culture for their game. Like it just did not work. And the cool thing about the mist, you know, they couldn't get the mist, so they had to do their own thing. And that's that's uh half of the There is another of- reference to the mist in the game besides the fog. It's his little statement when he uses the notepad for the first time. It's very, oh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. very similar to Spoilers. what the protagonist says at the end of the mist in the original novel. The cool yes. thing about that is you have a lot of um, people who go out and they want to do one thing and they can't do it for whatever reason, legal or or whatever, and they have to do their own own version of it. So George Lucas originally just wanted to straight up adapt Flash Gordon. He, he made Star Wars, rights, so he made his own Flash Gordon. Um, same thing with the Shadow. Um, Sam Raimi wanted to do that. Um, but he couldn't get the rights, so he made Dark Man. So you have a lot of these people, who, or, or Death Stranding, where you have someone who wanted to do one thing, and for whatever reason it didn't work out, and then they make something much more personal and, and probably you know, arguably much more better because it's them, and it's not just them reinterpreting something. Yeah, I think my favorite example of that is uh, Night of the Living Dead. George Romero wanted to adapt, uh, what the hell's the name of it? I Am Legend. But at the time, a major motion picture studio was doing it. It was the Omega Man with Charlton Heston. And he's like, well, fuck. Uh, okay. And he wrote, he, he took the script that he had written and tried to kind of boil it down to a point where it wasn't I Am Legend anymore. And he kept having to change certain things and invented the modern zombie that way. Um, it's funny. Uh, we... Uh, so like Speaking of references, nowadays we, we know that Silent Hill... Is supposed to be in Maine, right? I mean, after the was not it? West Virginia. No, Chicago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but in old magazines, interviews, and previews, uh, Silent Hill was originally thought to be located in Chicago. But really, 
Yeah. Uh, they, uh, a lot of the previews were like a Western t- or a U.S. town in Chicago area. Apparently they had done a little bit of research in the Chicago during uh, E3 at some point. Uh, that's where they got, that's why it's like a lake resort town, you know, the Great Lakes and all that good stuff. Uh, but did you guys know that old Silent Hill is laid out eerily like Buffalo, Illinois? Uh, so I'm going to send you, I'm going to send you guys a link. So one second, let me click on this. Check this out and just, just try to remember. It's a square. Yeah. Yep. Here. Hold on. Because old Silent Hill is just nine so ch- squares. Check, check out that uh that map. Wow. I I didn't I didn't realize this until I was uh, I was on the Silent Hill Discord, and another user on there they watched my my one of my let's play Jesus, videos. Jesus, schools in the same place. Yeah, exactly. So it's very similar. Um, they even have an Elm Street. Every town has an Elm Street. <laughs> uh, they were like. Yeah, Oh, did you know about this? And I was like, no. And I looked at the map and looked. I mean, there's some differences, of course. But I mean, we got a church, the elementary school, the way it's shaped, a big square. I, I was I was really thrown by that. But what's interesting is the prototype Silent Hill, the police car said Buffalo on it. Did you know there's another <laughs> Buffalo reference in the game? Yes, Buffalo Bill. Oh, skins fifth. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Is, that, is that your favorite reference? I asked what everyone's favorite reference was in the game. Um, not like when I played them, references that I might have caught, you know, nothing really stood out. But I do like the fact that yes, it is modeled after a kindergarten copy because that's just funny. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, I do want to name the person who who pointed this out to me. It was Anwell, Will, and Will. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but I will show their name in the news post. But. They pointed that out to me, and now I'm like, why did I know this earlier? I could have pointed That's it out. That's awesome. Of course, we all know what Silent Hill's really based on, though. Centralia. Centralia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I know. God, I, the, the, I, all the listicles the tell me that. Dripping from your if you voice. Go, if you go east of Old Silent Hill, you go to Centralia Silent Hill. Mm. And then south of that is South Vale. And then sometimes they just straight up fucking forget and put the maximum security prison a block away from the hospital. Okay, look. No, 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 no. Tom fixed that in downpour. Now the prison's he on did. an island. The it's homecoming on a... still just forgot. No, that <laughs> wasn't Tom's fault. Look, he I fixed it. it. And now it's You're the one that brought up Tom. He said he put it he said in downpour, he's like, that was a stupid idea. So they put it on an island in the lake. So it makes a little bit more sense now that no, there's a maximum great. security prison. Yeah. I yeah. always <sighs> felt like the prison in Homecoming wasn't a real place. I kind of thought it was like a dream location. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, well, Homecoming is, is so... We'll get to Homecoming we will run, yeah, we, That's, <laughs> that's yeah. later. Another day. We're, we're jumping You're ahead. The- but I, I guess, uh, was there anything else you guys wanted to touch on? before we wrap this up silent hill one is a masterpiece and it's a shame that we probably wouldn't ever see it remade i'd love to see it given mm-hmm. the kind of treatment that like re2 remake got you oh know, yes oh my gosh with something like the fox engine you know tweak the gameplay here and there i think it could survive being coming in over bring the game. bring toyama back and just give it to the siren team they're not doing much right now well, don't they have <laughs> a new si- on doing much right now. Oh. don't they have a another siren game coming out no, though they were they were just celebrating the Siren series birthday, and as, oh. far, as far as Gravity Rush, that sadly as good as it was, that series bombed. No one bought Gravity Rush two apparently. Great yeah, game, it's bro. two really good games that they pulled a Konami on. Really, um, the games themselves are fucking excellent, but unless you knew about it, you didn't know about it. And underground only insiders information is really not the way to sell something that you spent millions and millions of dollars making. Well, speaking of Toyama, apparently him and Sawyer are hanging out in Sprite now. Oh. Yeah. He even, he even well, like, yeah. I was like, hey, oh baby. my God, my two favorite people. Well, we never got that Deadly Premonition news that they teased like last E3. Gravity Premonition. No. Well, I think it was the board game. Mm, I hope it's something. Or was it The Missing or The Good Life? It's no, you D4 said Chapter 2. 
Maybe it's going to come on Switch. Maybe that's what they're going to announce. Oh, great. 10 frames per second. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they'll... Cross over with Skyrim. Maybe they'll <laughs> get a decent port, finally. Maybe it will run okay. I keep Although I will hoping. say... I, I will say the idea of a uh, Francis York Morgan, Morgan Amiibo sounds delightful. Oh, yes, mm. it does. I would love that. Okay, well, um, I guess that was just the first episode. Uh, uh, next one, I guess we'll talk about Silent Hill 2. That one will probably be really long, too, because there's so oh much God, to say about it. There's so much more to say about it. I know. <laughs> this was, like, the most vague game, and we went on a long time. Well, we did go on well, tangents. Well, that one's got, like, this one's got Kaufman. And his vaguely across multiple games getting real uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. That one's got a whole lot of just straight fucking uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Very depressing. Right there in the game. Yeah. Is there anything you guys would like to plug before we sign off? I, I just want to say, uh, um, just going back to the game for a second. Um, recently, uh, for me, it hasn't lost any of its potency. And I think that's one of the sticking points to that original game is that even though I'm familiar with it, it's been a while since I played it, but um, just enough to kind of forget certain things, but it's still just as potent. And even to this day, even with all the other, other games that have come out and some of the more polished games, some of the more modern games, um, horror game. And I guess I'll be the dissenting voice in the, uh, the, the remake slash uh, continuing the series camp. Um, is kind of like repainting the Mona Lisa. Mm -hmm. I think that's always the golden, the holy grail with everything, you know, like um, Alone in the Dark. Oh, they should remake that. Or like Silent Hill. It's like, well, no. Um, for me, at least, like, they got it right the first time. I get bringing it to a wider audience. I get um, graphics. But for me, especially since it holds up so well today, it's not really about how it looks. It's more about how it plays and feels. So for me, a remake, especially in 2019, realistically get that right. I think if you have this dream team of getting Sato back and uh, you know Yamoka and Toyama back, th that's a pipe dream, though. And, and there's no way to do that without Konami. Would you try it, though, I mean, if they did? If they did try to remake it? Probably would. Um, I guess you could make the argument Shattered Memories was that remake. And to go back to what you were saying. Oh, I do want to. I would do want to say it, they originally wanted to do a remake and then they're like, no, make this right. instead. So Right. And I'm actually glad they did that. And maybe I'm also into the dissenting, um, <laughs> dissenting voice in I love Shattered Memories. Oh, so do we. So it's, it's my favorite Silent Hill game. Is, I'm sure yeah, I'm I was shocked when it got, that. got shit on online. I was like, well, the great thing about it not being a remake is there wasn't the pressure to be a remake. It could do its own thing. Now, some people didn't like that new thing. But for me, that was the freedom. It opened it up to to do whatever it did. And I, I thought it was awesome because of that. So well, I've I, always kind of strained against the idea of just a straight remake. I think RE2 is fine. Excuse me. It's fine because you still have people at Capcom that can pull stuff off like that. But again, I think... You don't have faith in Konami to do it justice. No, Konami has the Square think... Enix problem. All the good people have left. Mm, yes. I think Destiny, at one point, you had said something um, about the aesthetic of that 32-bit look and feel where... Where people are trying to remake it at this point. Well, no, um, about... It, I think it was a different podcast you referenced this, but about clear enough that they can render what they need to, and you know that's the building, that's a car... But it's also vague enough where you can use your imagination to kind of fill in the blanks. Oh, yeah, yeah, and I me. really, that's Rort, but he and I have that conversation about a lot of these older games a lot. Because I, I don't dislike the idea of a complete redo to change the controls, honestly. Uh, whenever the Resident Evil people were like, "Oh no, you have to keep the tank controls," and sitting there like, if they ever did Silent Hill, for fuck's sake, that's the one thing you should change. Um, not a whole <laughs> lot of fun. And while it would be nice to be able to see a little more detail on stuff, so much of that game is what you don't see. Exactly. So I think right. remaking it is, is almost missing the point. And I think that's such a knee-jerk reaction, especially now. Like, if you have a game that's 10 years old, we, we mentioned Nino Nukuni. 
I was like, that game just came out. Like, do we need a remake of something that's like, what is that, five years old? Or, oh, for sure. Or, yeah, it's just, I, I, I no, they're then, remaking fair, that's Nino Kune? Remaster. Or they're, yeah. they're, it's a remaster, but still. Still. Uh, like, that, it, it, especially for the type of game that it is, it doesn't need it. No, it it does make sense because it's coming to platforms that didn't exist on. That's all. So they're really they're is. they're yeah. remastering and porting it yeah. to different. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Well, I'd I'd like to to emphasize because I'm the one that brought up the idea of a remake. Is when I think of a remake, I don't think of something like the Crash Bandicoot remake, where it's it's the same game but now it looks really pretty. Like my gold standard is Resident Evil remake, where it's effectively a different game. I mean, it's the same plot, yes, and you visit the same areas, although they are heavily restructured, is that sort of what I think of with the idea of remaking Silent Hill is, and I think Shattered Memories does a great job of being a reinterpretation or even just a straight up kind of weird look back at those ideas. But the idea of doing something where it's the gist of Silent Hill 1's story, but giving us a kind of a new version of the town that isn't, doesn't have to adhere to the original version of the town more stuff to do, more creatures. It, like my dream scenario is the idea of a Silent Hill that's that literally gives us all of Silent Hill to explore, all four corners of the map. Oh, that'd be huge! Silent um, Hill yeah. seventy six. Fuck yeah! Mm-hmm. But um, but the you know have all of that, but the ultimate dream in my head would have all of that have it be a new experience that just follows the story. But have it also because you have to go back at the moment, a whole generation to the digital download on PS3, have it come with Silent Hill 1 just as a bonus feature. The thing's only like 200 megabytes. Just include the thing. I think it'd be a actually, good it's like for- it's like 700 and something. Really? That's big. Hold on. Let me look. Let me look because I had to rip it. I think there's always a good excuse to release the original. I mean, just because, um, just on. I mean, they could do it, maybe gussy it up a little bit to put it on modern platforms. But I guess I, I'll always be sort of against the idea of a, a just a straight remake, as good as it could potentially be. To be just use that energy and spend it on either something new that has those kind of elements, um, or 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 try to do a a new idea within that universe. Try to yeah, do it's like six six hundred megabytes work. Yeah, like wow, for the big. love of God, tell us what the hell happened to other Lisa. Mm. Fund that story. I am invested and want to know. Have energy and put it into something else, and not just. I mean, we have kind of endless remakes. Some are good, some are bad. But at the end of the day, you know, do we need to see how Spider Man became Spider Man a fourth time? You know oh I mean? yes, like, just like Batman. Mm. We need we need another Batman origin story. Martha. <laughs> Why'd you say that name? Um, but work. I I just wanted to circle back to a comment you made that said you were the only one who liked Shattered Memories. The most. It's my favorite Silent Hill. That's that's what I was. Work. Saying was, you know, my f- my site started as a fan site for that game. Oh okay. Yeah. So the more you know. I did. I did enjoy it very much. But Silent Hill One is is still my my favorite. Yeah, I mean, le- obviously we'll get to it, but. Like you were saying, William, that, that, you know, it uses Silent Hill 1 to jump off and do its own thing. And Shattered Memories, I think that, you know, people got caught up in the fact that, oh, it's changing things. Of course it's fucking changing things. It's not Silent Hill 1. And it's something, it should be. it's a good thing. And and we were talking because at they length about it. And then they, just, they, compl- they complained that it was too similar and it didn't do enough. See, that's the paradox you run into. Yeah. With- oh, of course. With, with any, well, I mean, any, half honestly. of that is especially with the Silent Hill fan community. And this isn't me saying, oh, I just hate Silent Hill fans. I am a Silent Hill fan. I'm part of that community. There is a certain subset of it that screams loudly about literally anything. We don't know what we want. at all. If they Mm -hmm. find something about a Silent Hill game and it was not Silent Hill 1, 2, or 3, some of them except 4, Everything about it is wrong. So when they hear that it's going to be a reimagining, it's, oh, well, it isn't the same thing. And then they go in and see that it has some of the same places. And then it's, I thought this was reimagined. They didn't even do their own thing. So it's like those particular people are Mm -hmm. probably a good 30%. I would give them one third of the reasons Konami was like, (laughs) fuck that game first. 
they're, they're just so people exhausting. live in the comments on my YouTube channel. Pardon? I said half those people live in the comments on my oh, YouTube yes. channel. Boiler theory. Oh, they'll live in the comments on this one. They just like, it's so weird. It's been how long since the Silent Hill game came out at all? And they're still just floating around like little Silent Hill amoeba. That's huh? all they live for. Yeah. Remember when Silent Hill 4 was the black sheep and everyone oh. hated that? Yes, I remember <laughs> when people were upset that Silent Hill 2 wasn't a continuation of Silent Hill 1. Where's the cult? It sucks now. And then they didn't Japan. like it. Silent Hill 3 was a continuation. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's fucking, you still can't love that game. I think that's one of the best people's ever made. The, we uh, we the, never the know reason... what we want. We don't know what we want. No. Don't try to please the fans. Never. Um, the, the, the reason I brought it up is we were talking at length about Lisa and, you know, and we were saying a lot of people were very upset how, you know, flirty Lisa is in Shattered Memories. But first of all, that's you. That's all you, baby. The game changes for you. She's not flirty in all the versions. But, um, the thing that, that I really love about Shattered Memories in regards to Silent Hill 1 is I think trying to play Shattered Memories before it is a bad idea. Because the fact that it is jumping off from Silent Hill 1's story, I feel makes it all that much more impactful and emotional. Because you know, I hadn't played Silent Hill 1 before I'd played Shattered Memories and have since gone back. And I didn't have the context for most oh, of God, the things Oh God, no, it Shattered makes Memories that game hurt. And I specifically remember now having played Silent Hill 1, going and playing Shattered Memories again, and finding Lisa and immediately being like, oh no. Oh no! <laughs> Just well, and it's all the tiny little callouts. Like there's the big ones, sure, but it's all yeah. the little bitty things that just add up. And by the end of the game, it just fucking ate. Which is which is interesting because you know, we're talking about this subset of a subset with with Silent Hill fans, like like the turfs of, fem of feminism with with the Silent Hill fans. That it's you know it's it's all we're conflicted. Everyone hates one thing; they don't hate another thing. Some of them are 50 50 that, uh, that like shattered memories again kind of embodies that in you know it's it's all about silent hill one but it's also kind of saying like these are your memories though and this they should be for be the perfect. shattered memories podcast sure but you know what i'm saying it now <laughs> <laughs> we can Don't worry. we're we'll supposed to be it. wrapping up <laughs> damn it Rourke. <laughs> shut the fuck up cj you were gone for like 90 percent of this <laughs> he had to walk <laughs> bow bow okay that's allowed. He had to take care of his puppy. Um, okay, but I do want to wrap it up. I, uh, can I uh, uh, shout out my channel? Yes, we're on three hours, so please give your <laughs> shout outs to your stuff. Go for it. Uh, you can check me out on YouTube as The Gaming Muse, M U S E. I do a series called Silent Hill Symbolism, where we talk about the literary symbolism and imagery in Silent Hill series and other stuff. And I've published a book on the second game. A uh, book on the first game is coming out soon. Woohoo! She is so talented. Go subscribe. I just did. Yay! Oh, thank you. What about and you I guys? I followed you on Twitter. What about you guys? What do you guys have going on and Rely on Horror? Uh, well, if you want to come check us out at relyonhorror.com, we've got daily horror game news, previews, reviews, and more. And if you really like us, you can come and support us on Patreon. As little as a dollar a month really helps us out, and it gets you access to our uh, commentary show. We have over uh, 24 of them now, I'm pretty sure, where we, we kind of go back and... Oh, 30. Christ. Um, where uh, sometimes we do bad movies, and it's got kind of a mystery science theater 3000 sort of thing. Or we sometimes do we still wait and... for them. Yeah. Wait, what? Um, we bring you on to them. Oh, oh, I'm or sorry. Yeah, you you, 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 you uh, cut off, so I was like, I heard my name and then nothing. <laughs> um, but yeah, so come check us out, or if you'd like, you can come check us out on YouTube, we're Relying Horror. You could go watch my Resident Evil Vendetta review from two years ago, and call me all sorts of bad names in the comments, because, oh, oh, oh boy, it's two years old, and I still get comments on that video. Oh, By the man. way, that's patreon.com slash horror. You have a Patreon as well, AJ? I do. Uh, Patreon, The Gaming Muse, M-U-S-E. Not mouse. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have a Patreon. But I do have a new Let's Play YouTube channel. It's called Whitney Plays. I have an in-depth Silent Hill Let's Play I completed a, a month or so ago. I worked really hard on it. And all this year long, I am streaming 
almost uh, daily. I take breaks, but I'm streaming random horror games I never finished or I really liked, trying to raise money for Extra Life. I am almost at $600. My goal is 1000 I'd like to hit, hit that and go above it, so please check me out. Uh, my Twitter is Kemi underscore Rowe. You guys probably already know my Silent Hill site. It's on historicalsociety.com. I do have a Silent Hill Twitter. It's sh underscore historical. I'm also on Facebook. Just look up Silent Hill Historical Society. I post links to stuff. Um, but yeah, that's all my plugs. William, did you have anything you wanted to plug? Um, in addition to contributing to Rely on Horror, uh, com. I also have my own YouTube channel, Screaming Wave Productions. That's where you can listen to the uh, uncut version of my interview with Michael Gwynn. I will link in. that in the news post. Talks in at just under two hours and 23 minutes. I also have um, two of his very hard to find. Um, um, the one from his commercials he did in Japan and the ones that he did that were more personal when he came back to America in, uh, I believe, 99. So... All three of awesome. those are on DreamWayProductions.com. Please subscribe. Thank you. Yay! So everybody, please send me your links so I can put it in the news post so I don't forget anything. Um, but thank you, everybody, for for listening. Again, I'm sorry again it's been so long, but I'm hoping to put out another podcast, I don't know, in a month or two, where we sit down and talk three hours, four hours, five, whatever, about Silent uh-huh. Hill 2. I didn't think it would go on this long. <laughs> Let's maybe do it early on the day next time. But I think we we went off uh, track a couple times. But yes. So. You know, speaking with shattered memories, you just stop it there. Um, but yeah, that's Voices in Static. I will talk to you all again real soon. Thank you for listening. Bye. Bye. Hey guys. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.